This is the Power Team America podcast, and today we're talking with back-to-back national champ Dana McNeil, who's dominated the 76-kilo division in the United States. We talk about her life in Japan, what it's like being in one of the most competitive and most watched weight classes in the world, competing against her idol and GOAT, Kimberly Walford, and so much more. But before we start, be sure to tune in to the grand finale of Power Team America's national championship season, sub-junior, junior, masters, and equipped national starting June 2nd in Scottsdale, Arizona. The competition will be streamed live by SBD on their YouTube channel, and you can always find it on the live tab of the powerlifting america website thank you to sbd and Eleco for the continued partnership with powerlifting america if you're looking to compete in drug tested powerlifting whether you're just starting out or you want to compete with the best in the world make sure you go to powerlifting-america.com and follow us on instagram at powerlifting underscore america all right with that let's get to this interview with back-to-back champ dana mcneil what is up? I got the back-to-back 76 kilo national champion dana mcneil welcome to the powerlifting america podcast how's it going dana all right not too bad how are you doing? What what do you got going on right now? So it's Saturday. I just have a bunch of house cleaning to do. But other than that, I'm doing this podcast with Paul, with you. Yeah. Yeah. I appreciate it. I appreciate it. Um, yeah, I want to have you on here because I think that you're one of the people now you're you're on the world's team again, the US national team going to IPF Worlds in Malta in about, you know, six weeks or so, six and a half weeks out for you. Um, and you're just you're like one of the quiet kind of working in the shadows. You're on the other side of the world. You're in Japan. So I think you kind of, you know, people, you're posting your stuff like at crazy late at night. And so people in the U S don't probably see it until they get up in the morning and stuff. Yeah. So I want to have you on and just kind of get your story out there, let people get to know you a little bit so that they can, you know, um, root for you for going to worlds and like get behind you and cheer for you and stuff, kind of hear a little bit about your story and everything. And um, you're also kind of mysterious because you have like, you know, you're working in Japan, you have like a a military job and stuff like this. You're very quiet. You kind of at nationals, you go, you fly under the radar big time. Like, you know, so, so yeah. So I just want to have you on and uh, get to know you a little bit. So, um, so what's going on with like, like today you were telling me before we started, just um, you're just chilling today. What's your, what's your weekly routine like? So as far as powerlifting, I train four times a week. No, as far as like where, tell us like where you're living at right now and um, what your like, you know, weekly schedule is like you're off today and you're chilling, you're not lifting or anything like that. Right. Right. Um, but yeah, just give us a little bit of a breakdown kind of like a week in the life of like what, what your life is like, Dana. It's very boring. Okay. So <laughs> as you mentioned, I'm living in Japan. The reason why is because I'm in the air force. So I'm stationed out here for the next year. So I'm supposed to leave in 2024. So Okay. Uh, station out here. So Monday through Friday, I just go to work. And then four times a week, I'll go to the gym. The job is nothing to write home about. It's pretty boring. It's an admin job. Um, oh. By trade, I'm a crew chief. So I'm an airplane mechanic. But for the past year, I've been off the flight line, working behind a desk, uh, running PT program, uh, safety program for, for oh. the squadron that I'm in. Yeah. So it's it's pretty boring just sitting at a computer all day answering phone calls answering emails and yeah, right. um that's like that's like such a typical like what jason board would answer you know yeah i think like who knows i don't know if this is accurate or not or you're that's, really just that, like that's the job <laughs> i could put a camera in my no. office and you'll just see me just sitting there just answering emails and phone calls and gotcha. hanging out with my coworkers. yeah gotcha and so you say you're like doing the pt program so you're basically like training people is that right or you're uh, right, so you're kind of running a program or yeah so I oversee the program so um we have people who work who I work with and uh they help people get ready for PT and administer the PT tests and I score them and upload them into the system and help people out when they fail so uh it's it's not as intense as as people think it would be, but it's exactly what a spy would say. <laughs> <laughs> Can't give away all the secrets. <laughs> I'm not, I don't have the, I'm not, I have authorized clearance or anything. So um, that's interesting. Cause I'm always like kind of nervous around military people. Cause I'm just like, I don't know, like what part of your job is like secret and like you're doing important things. That's all I know. And so um, it's, it's cool to kind of, I mean, in your case, what was, what was it like before when you weren't having the desk job, like when you were on the line and stuff, how, do you fly as well? No, I just, um, I just fixed the aircraft. So airplane mechanic, so I'm a crew chief. So it's, um, pretty much, oh, 
general maintenance. Um, then we, I work with specialists. So if we have a hydraulic leak, I can call it a hydraulic troop and then they'll come and fix the leak or I can assist them with it. But um, basically oversee all the maintenance on an aircraft. Okay. That's So I've worked on, um, you, you know, planes, uh, C-130s, KC-135s, and now I'm on AOX E3s and it's the like plane with the big radar dish on top. So that's okay. the plane I work on now. It's pretty oh, cool. That's awesome. That's really yeah. awesome. And uh, yeah, I mean, that's all exciting stuff. Like uh, my dad was a pilot, um, like flew like small planes and stuff. And oh, so okay. I've been around um, hangars and stuff before and like, yeah. um, man, planes are pretty complicated. <laughs> yeah, they are. <laughs> to say the least. Um, so no, you definitely need like a whole crew of people to work on them and stuff. Oh, definitely. Um, yeah. Um, and what do you like about living out there in Japan? How has that been treating you? Um, it's pretty different from living in America. Um, I still, because, you know, I work on an American base, there's still like the comforts of home, but just being out and about in the, um, in the city that I live in, it's, it's familiar, but it's different at the same time. I don't really know how to explain it. Um, it's just, I don't know. I like it. It's, it's pretty cool. Like I walked to the store today and I got me a hot coffee. So from the, uh, from like the Seven Eleven. Okay. I mean, nice. I've never seen coffee in a bottle that no, you get that's, that's already hot. Like you pull it out from the machine, but it's, it's already hot. Damn, it's that's cool. That, that's what I see. Like, um, when you, when you see like people doing trips to Japan and like, I follow a lot of, uh, photographers and stuff that are around in Japan and it's, it seems like very futuristic. Like they're like way ahead of us. Um, and, Some parts. Yeah. And like, like with stuff like that, where it's like super convenient stuff. Yeah. Um, like the food scene is like really, really awesome and stuff. It's like. amazing. Food is amazing. Yeah, so, so what do you like? What do you eat out there? So um, on my treat days, I'll have some sushi. So they have a conveyor belt sushi place. I've seen some of those places in America, but um I'll go there. I recently found this other sushi place and they make it um, behind the counter and then they'll serve it to you. It's, I don't know how to explain how fish can be so good, fish and rice and wasabi, but it's just, it's just so tasty. There's also, um, I live in Okinawa, which is a little bit different than mainland um, where Tokyo is, but um, they have this Okinawan soba. Okinawa is known for their, one of their dishes is soba. It's like a thicker, noodle ramen dish almost and it's so good so delicious so sushi and soba is a mainstay on my uh cheat days okay and i mean for a lot of people like for americans like that's that stuff's like probably pretty healthy um they would yeah they'd be doing good to eat that on their not cheat days um so how tight are you on on diet uh on you know watching your nutrition and stuff like that do you have to watch it pretty close no, not really. Um, I haven't, but I did hire a nutritionist to help me out because, you know, I always come in underweight no matter yeah. what weight class I'm in. So I just want a little bit of help there. And then, you know, also help out with performance. So I hired a nutritionist and, um, yeah, she just gives me my macros and it's pretty easy to follow when I do follow it. Um, I don't really have to worry too much about, um, I'm not really too worried about making weight or if I'm going to make weight. It's just a matter of, you know, getting to the meat. Mm -hmm. And, and you actually want to be, um, weighing in heavier than what you have been weighing. Cause yeah. I oh yeah. You're weighing in in like 74 in the 74s and you're at 76. Yeah. Um, is that something that do you think, because you, you have to pretty much for the last few meets that you've done, um, you've had to travel a long ways and it mm -hmm. does it have something to do with like, do you lose a little bit of weight uh, in the travel? No, I think, well, yeah, maybe. Uh, when I travel, I tend to uh, hold on to a lot of water. So I'll drink more water. And then I guess after I land and everything starts to even out then I lose all that water. But gotcha. I think that's why I'm always coming in light. Gotcha. Maybe. And yeah. And like I heard uh, Meg Scanlon talking last year about like she doesn't she, you know, because she moved up a weight class. And so she doesn't really have the problem of making weight she can eat like a lot and stuff and she's kind of building up to 63s but she meant she talked a little bit about like when she hired a nutritionist kedrick i believe for um south africa last year at worlds just like fueling your body properly to be an athlete 
-hmm. is a little different than just eating whatever, you know? Um, and, and so, um, she noticed big difference with that as well. So I think, I think that's one thing that you'll find, because even though you don't have a problem of like trying to make weight, it's like eating the right stuff. So you have the energy to perform. Yeah. Yeah. That's one thing I noticed after I started working with her name is Pia. She works out of a uh, fiercely field nutrition. And that's one thing that I noticed working with her, um, meal timings in accordance with, um, what do you call it right before you work out. So your pre-workout meal and then your post-workout nutrition and sleep and all that and putting all those little bits together have actually helped me out a lot just a matter of just adding more kilos to my body but you know uh that does help you can't just eat chips and you know drink soda and be okay you have to actually properly fuel your body for what you're about to do yeah that's a really good point i saw that you were working with her now does she does she also kind of coach you up on the sleep side of things. Cause I know, I think I saw some story posts or something that you were saying like, okay, now when you you're sleeping better, um, and it's amazing how training goes a lot better when you sleep better. Oh, uh, as she just told me I need to get more sleep. I told her how much sleep I was getting. So in the past I was getting maybe like four, maybe five hours a night Uh-oh. and then going to training. Yeah. Working when I was on the line, sometimes 12 hours and then going to train. And, um, she told me that I need to start getting more sleep. So, um, I just turned the TV off a little bit sooner, a little bit earlier and, um, sleeping probably averaging about seven hours nice. and I'm seeing how much of a difference it makes, not just for powerlifting, but you know, I can, I'm, I'm good. I'm good in life. Like, I just feel like I have more energy, more natural energy. Yeah. Yeah. Whereas of- I'm always fighting sleep, with, um, in the past. Yeah. Instead of always like relying on caffeine all the time um, right. like that to keep you going. That's, that's a huge deal. Yeah. I think I saw you post something like your, was it your colleagues in the office, like noticed that you had more energy or something? Yeah. Or, yeah. 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 They, they were tell me that I would you. sleep all the time. Yeah. And they would tell me I'll fall asleep <laughs> during meetings, but since I started sleeping more, um, I don't fall asleep during meetings. You just tell them, Hey, We'll, we'll write you a pass uh, for Power of yeah. America. You need to get a couple sleeps in during these these okay. meetings if they're if they're boring. Um, All right, like we, yeah, I'll, I'll give them. I'll I'll give them to my commander. We got a world championships to compete yeah. for here. All right, let's let her let's let her off the hook a little easy. If she's here nodding off in a meeting, just maybe put a little pillow under her head and let her let her get to, <laughs> let her get a little rest. These meetings aren't that important anyway. Just send her an email afterwards. Right, that could have been an email. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> That's cool. That's funny um, that, you know, when you think of people with military jobs, like I always just think of like, like, you know, the stuff you're talking about before, like with working on planes and like just being in these like hardcore situations, but a lot of it is desk job stuff too, you know? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that's probably very, like whenever I get a little glimpse, you don't, you don't post a lot of it, but like every now and then I get a little glimpse of like your office humor, (laughs) people making jokes and stuff. And so um, that's cool to see as well. Like, it's like a normal office just because it's military yeah. it doesn't normal mean it's office people in uniforms and that's it yeah, yeah. that's the only difference yeah yeah so how is training out there um what's the gym situation like so they have so they have a lot of different uh bases out here there's a couple different marine bases there's an air force base and there's a navy base so there's a bunch of places for me to go train at um i mainly train at this marine base um that's right down the street from me um, standard commercial gym, power racks. Uh, they, they do have power bars, so that's good. Nice. Um, but just power racks and hex plates. And I just train there, but I'm lucky because I'm out here with, um, some people who also power lift competitively. Um, one guy just moved, I think he, uh, got orders to Korea, but, uh, he was competing in USPA and, okay. uh, I'm out here with Ian Bell. He's, uh, an equipped lifter. He's, pretty big. Um, so I have that, that com- not just, oh, I'm interested in powerlifting energy of, of people around me, but people who are, who've actually been there, been on a platform and I'm able to, you know, tug their ear for, for knowledge and tips and stuff like that. So it's, it's pretty cool. So I'm not out here by myself. Yeah. Plus I would say that the up and coming powerlifting scene is, is a lot bigger than I thought it would be. So there's a lot of people out here, um, who do enjoy powerlifting, but not really sure how to get into it. And, you know, we just kind of sort of, you know, direct them towards the, uh, the Marines put on this, uh, this meet every May and December. So we direct them towards that. 
And then there's the Okinawa Powerlifting Association, which falls under the IPF. So some people have started doing that. Um, it's a pretty, uh, the powerlifting scene out here is, is pretty nice. That's really cool to hear um, that there's that. And so have you, have you ventured off like, cause yeah, I see that you're training on the hex plates. Um, and I know that's probably like for reps on deadlift and stuff can probably cause some issues here and there, but mm -hmm. otherwise, I mean, it's, you're, like you said, you're lucky you got a place that's got enough weight for you. Um, yeah. because you lift a ton and then you got Ian out there too. Who's like a living legend, living um, legend. Yes. So I'm, you know, I'm sorry. Living legend. And, and I mean, like really Gene is the living legend. Right. And, and like, yeah. like Ian is just like his son. No, I'm just joking. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's a living legend in his own right as well, but, um, yeah. that's super cool to have him out there, but have you like, like maybe with him and, and everything, like, have you guys gone out and gone to that Okinawa uh federation like gone to any of their meets or anything like yes how was you that? talked about japan being futuristic the meets are not as futuristic they're not as uh -huh. there's there's no tv screens everything is uh handwritten okay. and um so whenever people do their attempts then they write it on this piece of paper on the board and so you just kind of have to like monitor the board um i've been to some of those meets um they're still pretty fun there's there's a lot of there's a lot of energy. And then even though we don't speak the same language, the announcer is going, um, people are making their attempts or not making their attempts. Like we all know what's going on just based uh -huh. because we all powerless. So that's, that's pretty cool to see that, you know, even though we don't speak the same language, we can still speak powerlifting if that mm -hmm. makes sense. Absolutely. It makes sense. Um, I was at uh, the North American powerlifting championships in Panama this last year. And a similar kind of thing where, um, where on most of the days, I think pretty much the whole time, the the speaker was speaking in all in Spanish, you know, mm -hmm. and so, but it was like you could still hear exactly what was going on. And I think mm -hmm. he would he would do the numbers in English, like after he did it in Spanish. Oh, okay. And so it was, you know, yeah, you, and you kind of start to. I've already forgot how they say uh, bars loaded. Um, I, man, I forgot. It. I forgot it already, but it's, it's something, you know, and it's like, you start to just fall into that. You start saying that instead of saying bars loaded, you know? Yeah. Um, so it's, it's pretty cool to hear. And it's cool to experience those like different cultures, like you said, but then it's still, still us. It's like, it's power. Yeah. You feel right at home. Yeah. So how is it? Is it really slow? Like I've heard about meets in Texas, I believe like in Texas high school or something where they write stuff on a board or, or they used to use like, even like a big overhead projector thing. And they would like, write write out the attempts. And they said it, it made it go super, super slow. Like, I think Mike Z was telling me stories about this. Um, is it slow or is it, is it move, move along pretty fast? The meets are pretty slow. It's usually one platform with 30 lifters and they have four different flights. So the meets are all day, but oh, um, yeah, I've seen that they put the actual attempt selections on a program on a computer, but when they're writing it for everybody to see, they write it on a board. And instead of using lights, they use flags and actual cards. Mm -hmm. And what else? I think that was it. But yeah, the meets are the meets are really, really long. Like I think mm -hmm. the one in November was like eight hours. Mm, wow. Yeah. Yeah. And and for was, only 30 lifters. Yeah. Like that was a long get, day. Yeah, you could get 30 lifters done, you know, pretty quick in the US. Yeah. I think they only had one set of spotters too. So that, I don't think that made the meat go any faster. Yeah, so. for sure. But still it's, I, man, I think that is super cool. I think it's really nice. Um, did Ian go to that? Does he do that stuff with you? Uh, he went to, he went to this last one uh, just as a spectator. And then I think he's actually going to be a guest lifter at one in a couple of weeks. So that's oh. going to be cool to see. Nice. So you're going to be there. You're going to handle them. Uh, I don't know. Maybe probably <laughs> it'll probably be me. Yeah. It's getting, we're, we're only like two weeks out. You said so, so you better make a phone call. Better ask. Yeah. Better pop it'll, prob question. it'll probably, it'll probably be, probably be me. Okay. Okay. Good. Um, that's really fun. I think that would be something to see, you know, and are you guys like when you're at the meet, do people come up to you? and just be like, who are you? Like, you must be someone like really strong. No, really? No. They don't know. Yeah. Are they, are they too shy? Do you think, or what? I don't, well, I know some of the lifters, some of the, um, uh, locals who, who lift in the OPA meets because they also lift on base or I've seen them around. Um, okay. 
but no, not too much. Well, one guy, he did say that he follows us and he thinks that we're really strong. But for the most part, everyone's just like off in their corner in their zone at the meet, just trying to get their lifts in. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, um, in that part of the country, because there's so much military, U.S. military presence, like they must be kind of used to seeing Americans around and stuff. Yeah, uh, I think so. Okay, so it's probably not as weird. Yeah, like whenever I travel to India, where my wife is from, and I go to her really small hometown, people, when I walk around in the streets, people just like come out of their house and just stare <laughs> at me and stuff. And they're just like, oh my God, this guy's like six foot two, you know, and like, and like, they don't see very many Americans like where she's from. So, but I guess in your case, you're you're not as much of a freak because it's like the, there's military around, like they yeah. see U.S. American people all the time anyway. And so, um, but I would think still at the power of the team meets, they'd be like, oh, we know who she is. Yeah, she's crazy strong. Yeah, no, not so much. So maybe we'll see like whenever you, you roll up with Ian, they'll they'll be like, uh oh, here comes the American crew. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> but uh, all right, cool. That's that's really um I thank you for telling us about that kind of stuff because I think like, you know, we've if you listen like King of the Lifts and stuff, they've interviewed uh Kanan, I believe her name is. Um, mm -hmm. that's in like the Japanese Federation. We just saw Yuki was at Sheffield. So Japan is, you know, and I, I'm not, I, I'm not, I'm not like a historian of powerlifting by any means. I don't know like the whole history, but I know that Japan has been around. I know that they're known for having like really good bench press mm -hmm. techniques and stuff like this. And um, so it's cool to see a um, little bit behind the scenes of what's going on out there in Japan. And it seems like this guy, Yuki, that was at Sheffield. I don't know if you follow kind of like what's been happening with powerlifting in France, where Pena has been kind of like this, this big figure that has really like put the sport on the map. And mm -hmm. maybe it'll be a thing like that with Yuki, where he like kind of puts the sport on the map a little bit and like tr builds up the social media side of things a little bit more. Yeah. For Japan. Yeah. So, I haven't been, I've, I've heard, but I haven't like looked into it or anything. Yeah. Or well, obviously for that. You're busy. You're there for a reason. Uh, and I can tell, you know, like I, I follow your, your training close. I mean, you can tell like, you know, you, you're regimented. Um, and so you probably don't have time to, do you get to travel around and go to other parts? Like, do you go to Tokyo? So I've been to Tokyo before. So I've been actually stationed in Japan before, but, um, I haven't been in Tokyo on this round, but okay. So it's been maybe, here. maybe soon. I think, I think it's supposed to go in August. Okay. I think I'm going in August. Just for fun or just, just for just, fun. Yeah. Nice. Nice. Is it cool? Oh yeah. yeah. You have the chance to go. Go. Yeah. That's it's Definitely on my, go it's, see yeah. all the things, go do all the things in Tokyo. It doesn't even matter what you do. You can just walk around. Just, I think Tokyo is a nice place. Yeah. I think Okinawa is a nice place. If you have the chance to travel, just get out and travel. That's how I yeah, feel. For sure. I, I definitely, Japan is like super high on my list. Um, there's a, uh, so many, um, famous, really famous street photographers um, from Japan and stuff. Like photography scene in, in Japan is really big. Um, mm -hmm. And what's the name of this area? It's called like Shibuya or Shibuya. Shibuya. Uh, yeah, like in it's in Tokyo. It's like a yeah. part of it or something like a nightlife yeah. scene or something. It's like a, I think Tokyo's separate into, I want to call them districts. Okay. And I think Shibuya is one of the districts, if I'm remembering correctly. Probably okay. the wrong word, but yeah. Yeah. I always see street photographers go in there and like, mm -hmm. like, um, street photographers from around the world. Um, they like travel out there to go and do that, do it there because it's like just amazing looking and everything really cool yeah. scene. The so, Shibuya crosswalk. Yeah. And just like, there's like good food scene, good nightlife. It's like mm -hmm. just a cool happening place for sure. Um, that's awesome. That's so you mentioned before that you, like when we first started talking about Japan, that you were supposed to be coming home in 2024 is that right and so what's yes. the status of that uh right now uh if i don't extend out here then um i'll leave here in 2024 like august time frame august september next mm -hmm. year but if i do extend then i could probably extend until for a couple more years i don't know what i want to do yet and it's almost that time for uh to make a decision all right. Well, let's decide right now while we're on the what? air. <laughs> um, so what would you do if you came to the U.S.? Uh, or, or or where would you go if you weren't, if you were leaving Okinawa? Because it might not even be the U.S. Yeah. If I had my choice, I would probably want to go back to England. 
Okay. That was pretty cool. I mean, I've lived in the U.S. my whole life. Like, why yeah. not be out and travel while I can? Yeah. Um, but I really enjoyed my time in England, um, and I want to go back there. If not, if I had to go back to the U.S., there's only a couple of bases for me to choose from. I think uh, for my airframe, it's Oklahoma. Oh, dang. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> Oh dang! Uh, yeah, yeah. If uh, I stick with, if they keep me on a wax on the E three, then it's it's Oklahoma. That's no good. Um, yeah. Where are you, where are you from uh, originally in in US? So my dad was in the army, so I'm an army brat. But okay. I claim Maryland because I lived there the longest. I, think oh. I was there for like six, seven years. Uh, Oklahoma's a long way from Maryland. <laughs> <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> So, okay. Yeah. I would probably, um, you know, like selfishly power up in America, we would love it for you to be in the U S and like yeah. go to local meets and like be involved more in the scene and, and, you know, be able to come out to all the different national championships and stuff like this and, and whatnot. But man, I wouldn't wish having to live in Oklahoma on anyone. So, um, uh, Oklahoma's not the- bad. It's, no, I it's guess. horrible. I don't know. I'm from it Nebraska. I'm, I'm from oh. Nebraska. It's only like it's only like four or five hours north. Oh, okay. And it's basically the same, but um, you know, it's just hotter and and uh yeah, less it's just less uh advanced, let's say. Oh. Okay. <laughs> as as uh as Nebraska, but um, you know, because we have this historic rivalry with our football teams um, in Nebraska and and OU, the Cornhuskers so. and the Sooners. Yeah, exactly. So in me, o- Oklahoma's like growing up. It's like bred into you to like dislike Oklahoma. Mm. Um, but now it's that that's the past. Well, that's where you're coming from. Okay, I'm I'm dating myself too because this is like super old school stuff. Um, oh, okay. You know, lately Nebraska has been so bad, and Oklahoma has been actually pretty good. So. Mm. So, you know, whatever, but, um, if, so where were you stationed before when you were in, you said you were in late in England? Yeah. So I was at a base called Milden Hall, which is about two hours from London, two okay. hour. Yeah. Two hours from London. What'd you like about it? What'd you like about how, and how long were you, were you out there? So I was out there for three years and I just like everything about it. I think I really liked the travel because when you're in Europe, the travel you can just catch one of the little um, jets and just yeah. go pretty much anywhere for for pretty cheap as long as you have a passport. You know, you can go wherever. I think I went to uh, Spain, went to Mallorca, wow. Germany a couple times, France. I mean, it's just it just I think I just like it because of the like where you can you can just travel for really cheap. Uh huh. And you London get, was was pretty cool too. I really like London. Yeah, I do too. Um, I went to London for um, a photography job once, and it was never high on my list of places to visit. Like because I kind of when I was younger, I always kind of wanted to go to places more like developing countries um, and and less in Europe. I always kind of thought like when I'm old, I can go to Europe and it's like convenient and stuff. But I went there when I was, I don't know, must've been like 27 or 28, something like that. And oh man, it, it blew away my expectations. It was so cool. And like yeah. the tube was so good. I mean, um, public transportation in the US is so bad. Even uh, like I spent a lot of time in Chicago, like the L is like, okay, kind of gets you around a little bit, but you pretty much have to take a cab like from the L or to get to the L and stuff. And man, the tube was just so, so convenient. Like actually takes you to places that you want to go and like, not like pretty much pretty close to them and stuff. Yeah. Oh, I was, I was, I really liked it a lot. I really liked it a lot. I mean, there's a reason why it's one of the best cities in the world, you know? Yeah. Very interesting. There's always something to do there. Yeah, totally. Oh man. I went to just like photography museums, like so many of them, like probably like 20 of them everything from small little galleries to like, you know, national portrait gallery, um, mm-hmm. type stuff. And yeah, it was awesome. Uh, I liked it a lot and, and so international. Um, I think like they're like, my wife is from India, like I said, and, and, uh, they, every restaurant, like a lot of restaurants have chicken tikka masala, you know, like mm-hmm. that's like one of their national dishes with fish and yeah. chips and stuff. And so, yeah, yeah, super international city, everywhere you go, you hear people speaking different languages, like on yeah. the tube. I love that kind of stuff. Yeah, very cool place to go. Um, how do you like the weather? How do you like the weather in in uh, England? You know, I made it, made it through. Do you like uh, it hot and humid like where you're at now? 
no it gets really humid here like really mm-hmm. really humid if you don't stay on top of it you'll have mold in your house you have mm-hmm. to keep your dehumidifier so I don't like it this humid but mm-hmm. I think the weather in England was okay it wasn't I mean it was overcast a little rainy but you know it was it was fine yeah yeah I like any place where it's like not too hot like that's yeah favorite. Like I was yeah. telling you before, like I, I was start sweating at the drop. I think it got to like 70 degrees outside today. Oh no, and you're I, sweating. I, and I feel like it's my house like heated up. I was like, damn, we're about to turn on the air conditioner. Oh no. <laughs> so yeah, no, I'm not, I'm not cut out for the, uh, the hot and humid weather anymore, but, um, all right, well, let's get into some, uh, so a couple of powerlifting things. So first thing before we get into your stuff, um, you know, you're raining back to back national champion can't say it enough times <laughs> what do you say two times two times to- three times two times two times okay two times, Only two two. times. yeah 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 okay i thought maybe i was missing one um but yeah two times back to back um but some really big thing happened recently sheffield and um it's something that it kind of has a whole power thing world talking and buzzing about how cool it was and everything what was what's your take on it how did you watch it what do you think about it I didn't watch it live because I think it came on really late here, but uh, when I woke up the next day, I turned it on. I watched it. Um, I was not expecting any of that. It was, it was really, really amazing to watch. I think um, everyone involved as far as the uh, lifters, I feel like everybody put on a show and it was, it was incredible to watch. Like, I don't, I wasn't going to watch it. I'm like, well, I don't want to watch it, but like, yeah. let me watch it. And I don't know. I was very, very impressed by, by everyone. Like, Yeah, it was. Um, so were you watching the 76s? I watched the whole thing. Um, but yeah, watching the 76s, I really wanted to see what they were going to do. Mm-hmm. And uh, they just keep pushing the bar. <laughs> like they just... They're so like, those ladies are so strong and it's just so impressive. And then it just makes me want to work harder. Like just when I think that, okay, maybe this is the cap for 76s, like somebody else comes along and it's like, no, this is, you know, the, someone who's going to push it along even further. Mm-hmm. Like, I was just watching. I was just waiting. I was, I don't, I don't know. What were you going to say? I was like, I didn't think that they were going to be able to uh, do what they did because, was it Carlina? She squatted 500? Uh, yeah, let me let me switch it to pounds here. I got the results Same. here. Oh, but here yeah, go. Carlina squatted 492.7. That's ridiculous. Um, yeah, and I think if I pull her up, she if if we do it in pounds... Yeah, she's like knocking on the door at 500. She had 491.6 in the New Zealand and the Commonwealth Championships. Well, she and, did last, but and she still. she went for 511 at Sheffield and and got called on depth, mm-hmm. I believe, right? And I think she stood it up like pretty, yeah, pretty well. Yeah, yeah, she stood it up, and I think she got called for like maybe depth and maybe oh yeah, I remember there was like she kind of paused it for a second on the way up, and I think she got one card that was like up and down and one up and on down, depth, yeah, something like that, yeah. But it pretty clean. I mean, that was like pretty strict refing because I think like if that was at PA Nats, like that probably would have passed like as a good squat, you know. Yeah. I mean, that was five eleven. As a seventy six. Yeah, as a seventy six. That's crazy. Yeah, it's super crazy. Um, she has absolutely. So, what do you think about her? Like, um, when when was the first time that you you heard of her and everything? Um, I think someone had commented on a on a post I forgot the post but they were like um yeah this girl in New Zealand she just did uh whatever I I don't remember what meet it was but she did a meet and oh she did the meet and broke the total unofficially broke the total world record and I'm like well who is that so I went and looked like it's really strong like I thought that uh I thought that you know the 76s. I'm not going to say I thought it was going to be easy, but I, people are coming out of the woodwork all the time. So yeah, yeah making it uh, a challenging weight class, but it's also, I feel like it's good to be challenged, you know, good to have that 
someone who's going to, and I said this earlier, set the bar, move the bar along, mm-hmm. you know, and keep everyone on their toes. Who knows who else is out there? Oh goodness. I mean, I think it, I think the 76s um, have kind of inspired, you know, power, the power team world in a way for exactly the reason that you just said is kind of like, this could happen to any weight class mm-hmm. where, I mean, it looked like Jessica Bittner was going to be dominant. It looked mm-hmm. like when they created this weight class, it looked like it was like perfect for her. She was, her doing weight class, really, yeah. she was doing really big cuts to get down to 72, you know, and then like now she's got 76. It's like perfect for her. Um, you think she's going to just smooth, sm- smooth sail to like, you know, a couple world titles at least. Yeah. And then boom. Right out of the gate. It's like, Nope, here comes Agatha from Poland and pushes her to <laughs> yeah. the limit yeah and then boom oh you thought that was cool like a couple months later here comes carlina like mm-hmm. puts up like a 590 and then goes and does commonwealth games which was an ipf uh proved me and she actually did break the world, official world record and push mm-hmm. it up to 100 um which is which is just wild and then like you're just thinking to yourself like damn like this this changed in a heartbeat and it could happen it to any it could happen to any of us like yeah. in any class but it's yeah, in yours. That's yeah. that's but no. <laughs> but that's okay though. That's okay. Yeah, because um, I mean, your your total that you did at Worlds, um, 532.5, you know, that was I mean, this is a new weight class, so it's hard to compare um, you know, how that would have done like in years past. You can't go back like five years and say like that would have won worlds five years ago or something. But there was an extremely competitive total um that you put up in South Africa. And then you see these ladies now coming out and pushing it all the way up to like 600. And then at Sheffield, you know, they, they all were doing high numbers like this, you know, like, uh, I think they're all getting close. Like, so it was Jess, let me switch it back to kilos here. Um, you know, she did a 580, 593 for Carlina and Agatha on like on a really bad day at Sheffield. 556 i mean these are just crazy numbers like that's it's gonna be hard to, you you were this close to getting on the podium you know mm-hmm. um and then now it's like you see these three women in front of you and it's like damn like it's gonna be hard to get on that you get on that podium that's like winning a world championship like you just get in third place you know yeah super inspired though they're all very it's all strong in there they all have it seems like they all have their own specialties carlina she seems like she's a big squatter Agatha yeah. is the bencher and then Jess has that crazy, crazy deadlift. So, you know, yeah. it's, I'm happy to be in the same weight class as them, you know, it just goes to show uh, the 76s is super competitive and I don't know, yeah. it's just, it's just, I'm happy, but at the same time, I was like, why does it have to be my weight class? I just want to be able to <laughs> watch it from afar. <laughs> yeah. But at the same like- time, like I said, they just keep, where they know it or not, they just keep pushing me, you know? So whatever I do, I'm just, you know, I'm just happy to share the platform with them. That's a really positive way of looking at it. Um, you know, you talk about Jess's deadlift. You you have a crazy deadlift. I mean, your deadlift is right there. Um, we were looking, I'm just looking at the results from Worlds and the attempt that you pulled and almost got um, for your third. You know, that that was only nine kilos behind Jess. when she, And that was a world record deadlift that she pulled to win it. So mm-hmm. you're, you're like right there on the edge with that deadlift. Um, you did get the silver medal in deadlift. Um, and that was with your second attempt. So, you know, three attempts, there's a possible gold medal sitting for you there. Like you never know what's going to happen now, especially with that three-way battle going on. S- someone's going to have to pull Like, like we kind of saw it a little bit at Sheffield where, you know, Jess had to load up something that she wasn't fully comfortable pulling ends up missing her third deadlift and normally she she makes her third deadlifts you know mm-hmm. um and then same thing carlina missed a couple of lifts agatha had had a really challenging day missed mm-hmm. several lifts and so you never know until it's over you know right. so and and you have a big final say in that with having that big pull so i think it's exciting and then like you said yeah it's a blast for outsiders like myself the powerlifting nerds of the world to watch this weight class because um besides the fact that you had Jess and Agatha kind of battling it out there um, for a world record total. You had you and Kimberly, like Kimberly is one of the greatest. She, she is the goat, right? Like, yeah. like she's a legitimate, like we throw that word around a lot, but like she is legitimately the mm-hmm. goat, multiple weight classes. 
and um, you guys had a fun battle going on. You tried to to pull to beat her, you know, um, at, at Worlds and everything like and that. So it's it's definitely like the most fun weight class to watch right now. And that has to be kind of fun that you're right there in the mix and that you're going to get to pull probably second to last or last one, of you know, somewhere around mm-hmm. there. And so like, no matter, like, you know, even if you're not in contention on total, it's like, you're going to be looked at, like, everyone is going to be watching your third deadlift. So that's, that's cool. That has to be yeah. like a bit of an extra fun part of it. No pressure. No. <laughs> <laughs> Are you the kind of person that gets affected by like that kind of stuff? Like, do you think about, because you seem so like you don't care about anything as far as what other people think social media or like even meeting you in person in, in Austin a couple of times, you're just like doing your own thing. You seem like super unfazed by anything. I just try, especially at a meet, I just try to not look around too much and just try to focus on what I can do instead of what everyone else is doing. I feel like that's the handler's job to focus on what everyone else is doing. And then they just let me know, okay, this is what we have to do, you know, to, you know, accomplish this goal. So usually whenever, because you, you've only seen me at meets, that's usually just my focus is just um, yeah. making weight and then performing on the platform. I don't really like to look around too much. I might talk to whoever I'm sharing a, a, a warm up rack with or something, but that's pretty much the extent of it. But yeah, I don't, if I start focusing on what other people are doing, um, especially being in the 76s, like, <clears throat> excuse me, on meet day, it's it might start to bother me. Sometimes it bothers me on social media. So I just have to mute a bunch of people, but so, you know, so that they don't show up on my feed. Yeah. But um, for the most part, you know, I just try to just, you know, chill out by myself. Zone in a little bit. Yeah. Get in the zone. Um, if I remember at, uh, in Austin this year, so like Austin last year, I like, you were very cool. You know, very chill, like very quiet. Like I said, like mm-hmm. under the radar, um, feel, seemed like this one, you came out of your shell a little bit. I seem to remember seeing you kind of like moving around a little bit. You, your brother was with you. Yeah. That's um, probably why. Yeah. I and I mean, with me. and you're, you're, you're the queen of the 76s in the U S. And so it's kind of like, you kind of had a little bit more of an air of like, this is my house, um, kind of vibe from you this time than, than you did the first time uh, when we were there. Also, I was trying to hype myself up because I don't know if I mentioned it, but I was dealing with like a little injury, a hamstring glute injury. And so instead of being, you know, what was me and trying to think about, you know, what I couldn't do and just focus on, you know, brother, he's good at, you know, helping me take my mind off the situations. And then, you know, we just vibing out and um, I just relied on him and he got me to where I needed to go. Yeah. Um, is he going to come out to Malta? No, he's not. He's okay. going to do um, a quick nationals. And that's, I think, the week before Yeah, it uh, is. Malta. So he's doing a quick nationals. He's prepping for that right now. So I'm excited to watch him. I wish I could, I wish I could uh, just fly back to the States and, and watch him mm-hmm. and, and maybe, you know, help him out at his meet. But um, is that, yeah. an, is that not, an... I know he'll be watching. Is that a new thing? Did he do a local meet or something already too? Yeah, he did a local meet. Um, okay, I want to say back in February. Okay. Maybe March. Okay. It I was... think, I think you, uh, yeah, I think you uh, reposted him or something like that. Cause I never, I remember I started following him around that time. And I think it was cause you posted him. Um, and I was like, Oh, we got another McNeil in the house. Hey, he was, he was the original power lifter. I just, I just kind of followed him. So was that big brother? No, he's a little brother. But oh, wow. he's I big, wasn't. Though. <laughs> yeah, he is. I wasn't interested in powerlifting until he started doing. It. I'm like, what are you doing over there? Let me try this. Okay, awesome. Yeah. That's cool. Oh yeah, it was it was great to see. Um, just you got you two together. He was real quiet too. Like not, he's not super chatty by any means either. Um, oh, you can tell it kind of runs in the family. At least at least around me. Oh. Uh, like in the press conference in the media room we were hanging out before you were weighing in and stuff and, uh, or you were trying to use a scale or something the day before you were lifting or something like that. And he was, he was just kind of like surveying the situation and, uh, wasn't super chatty or anything like that, but I'll definitely have to chat him up in uh Scottsdale. Oh yeah. Oh, you're going to the meet too. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. Our crew is, um, going to have a rough, a little bit of a rough go there. Cause like you said, we got, 
Scottsdale and then turn mm-hmm. right around and head out to Malta. Malta. Yeah. Yeah. But you can catch your breath. Like it's Scottsdale is going to be more, it's more taxing. Our nationals are more taxing on us as a team because we're running the meet, you know, and mm. everything like that. Yeah. Whereas when we get out to Malta, it's just all we got to do is handle, um, you know, game day coach, the athletes, and then, you know, like I handle media stuff and then our refs will go ref and whatnot, but we're not like trying to set up the whole thing and do all the, you know, the running around that you see at our nationals. So, but um, getting back to, so in general, are you like, are you a fan of powerlifting? Do you watch like other weight classes? I mean, you're at world, so you're probably, it's more difficult to watch. Um, but like, if you weren't there, would you be watching on online on a live stream or, or catching up on it the next day? Or do you just kind of catch it on Instagram the next day? No, um, I'll try to watch it live. Um, <clears throat> well, everything comes on late here. So I'll watch up until usually like first or second attempt bench. And then I have to turn it off and go to bed because it's, you know, like one o'clock in the morning or something like that. Yeah. But yeah, I would, I would, I like to think that I'm a fan of powerlifting. Um, I do enjoy watching the sport. I enjoy um, watching other people enjoy the sport. Um, like I said, I'm out here in Okinawa and there's a lot of up and coming powerlifters or, or people who aren't sure about what powerlifting is. And uh, sometimes I'll go up to them, I'll say, do you compete? And they'll say, no, but I'm interested. And I'll say, okay, well, here's, you know, the competition schedule for, you know, the, the local meets. Um, just trying to get people into the sport. That's awesome. And um, I do, I, I do like the sport. I do. It's, uh, it changes very fast because the scene today is different than it was when I first started. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. It, oh yeah. It's it, like, it has... Yeah. It's changed many, many times over the past couple of years, but um, yeah, I like to think that I'm a, a fan of the sport. That's cool. That's good. Yeah. And you're, you're an ambassador for the sport too. Like you said, like getting new people in, getting them into competing and stuff. And that's just like all it's, we all know that it just takes that first little itch that you get mm-hmm. and then boom, you're in it for life after that. So, um, people like you out there helping spread the good word about powerlifting, like that's really, really useful. And then being such an accomplished lifter yourself, you have so much to offer. Do you do coaching or anything? Do you train anyone? I mean, you do you train the, the squadron with the PT stuff. Oh right? yeah. That's different. Yeah. Uh, but with powerlifting, uh, I don't do coaching. I have handled before. So I've handled at a couple of, um, local meets here. Mm-hmm. It's very stressful. I don't know if I would, uh, actually ever get into coaching, but I can give people tips and, and tricks and stuff like that. But as far as like, Hey, click the link in my bio for coaching. I don't think that I'll do that. No. At least not right now. Mm-hmm. That's not something that that I want on my plate. But if you need a handler, yeah, in Okinawa. In Okinawa, yeah, nowhere else, just Okinawa. <laughs> Call me. Perfect, perfect. That's fun. I think I think um, handling is even at local meets is super fun. Um, yeah, and especially when you're working with people, that's like the first. I remember my first meet and and I just kind of like got someone that I knew was experienced um and kind of lined them up in advance to like be my coach on the day and it was so useful and they taught me so many little things uh how to warm up you know and and timing attempts and just all kinds of little uh, cues and stuff like and it's just it's you can make a, such a big difference in someone's life by just going and showing up and giving them those three, four hours, whatever it is, mm-hmm. um, at a local meet and helping them out. So I think it's super rewarding, you know, like they'll, I'll remember, like, I remember this guy for life, you know, like who helped me out. And so, I mean, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a really good, it's really rewarding. Yeah, it is. Especially like when you have people and they say, okay, well, this is my max. And, you know, I just want to do this amount and you're looking at them lift as a handler and you're like, no, I think we're going to go up, you know, yeah, a lot more. And then they hit it and then they're surprised that they hit it. Like that's a, it's a good feeling to watch someone see something that they didn't think that was possible for them. Yeah. And they're like, thank you for believing in me. I'm like, you did that. I didn't do anything. Yeah. 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 All I did was give you a little pat on the back and uh, yeah. put, write a number down on a piece of paper and put it in. Yeah. That's all so, I did. Yeah. yeah. But that's, what's so cool is like, um, once you've been in the sport for a while and you have that experience, it's, it's so easy. Like, it's like, it's like, we could do that kind of stuff with your eyes closed, like help someone out at a meet, like someone Mm -hmm. at a very beginner level, 
um, there's, you get a lot of bang for your buck with that kind of stuff. You know, it's like mm -hmm. show up at a local meet. You could help out like five, six people. Yeah, um, I did. I almost had to. I love I that. I almost had to. Yeah, I love, luckily I, uh, someone else showed up and they they took two people. So I, instead of having to handle four, I only handled two. That's and I was only expecting to handle one, but you know, it was, it, it made for a good day. Exactly. It makes it more fun. Um, yeah. Like a lot of times with local meets, like it's not as intense as like a nationals or worlds, obviously, where, you know, there's a strategy and putting in change right. attempts and you got to be super on the numbers. It's kind of laid back. It's like, you know, we're not going to make too deadlift. We're not going to change their openers and stuff like that unless something's yeah. going wrong. Um, or unless we're going to bump stuff up because you see that right. they are sandbag and everything like which is very mm -hmm. common. Uh, so yeah, that's really cool. Um, it's good to see. Um, and I think, man, it, could you imagine someone like it's a local lifters, their first me, they're Okinawa and they're like, Oh my God, Dana McNeil just like came out of the shadows. I didn't even see her there. And then all of a sudden she was my game day handler and she just took me under her wing and then boom, they go on to be like the next, like, you know, Carlina or whatever in their weight class. That's crazy. That's crazy to think about. And it's no, so easy. Uh, for, it's so easy for us, like, you know, to, to just basically take, take a day. Yeah. You know, all I gotta do is ask, just ask, I'll be there. Yeah. 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 Cool. Well, we'll put, we'll, I'm going to, we have to call the Okinawa fed and be like, Hey, we need to get, get Dana in as an official uh, member of the, of the, Okinawa IPF league or whatever you get you guys get you reffed up you can start reffing meets over there <laughs> the third person that said that reffing <laughs> is stressful I reffed at local meets unofficially before and uh -huh. I was stressed I'm like if I don't give this person a white light I'm just gonna feel so bad yeah you'd be better off as a game day coach anyway because you're an athlete you know you have way more to offer um I think like anyone can ref but I mean it is hard it's like you got to take the tests and all that kind of stuff mm -hmm. it's like it's a big time commitment and stuff and it's yeah. way more boring honestly you have to sit in the chair yeah. the whole, the whole day oh, i might i might do it we always need volunteers and powerlifting 100 so. it's good to get that and then that way you're available something happens mm -hmm. you you're you know you're there and some ref doesn't show up or whatever it's like boom you're ready to go yeah absolutely i mean that is one of the things that's like i think it it's a big hindrance actually not having enough refs in areas, um, training mm -hmm. up enough refs because it is, it's, it's not as you have a front row view, which is cool. Like you're right there on the platform. So you're kind of experiencing it with the lifters, but you're also just sort of like sitting the whole time, you know? Mm -hmm. And it's just like, for me, sit, I can't stand still. You see me at meets. I'm like running around like a crazy man. I put me in a chair. That's like putting me in a, insane asylum or something yeah. you know, in a straight jacket putting a straight jacket on <laughs> yeah exactly like no i can't i gotta be like i gotta be running around i can't have yeah but but anyway but that's cool that you like to give back and everything that's really good um that's what we need so all right so let's um talk a little bit about your actual performances um so the the most recent one we'll let's start with the most recent one and we'll go back and we'll go back to worlds after that but okay. we kind of talked about it a little bit already you back-to-back -back national champ. You came into Austin, handle business, um, put up a, what was it? A 535 kilo total, yeah. um, which like, as we were saying, that's a very competitive total in the 76s. Um, so just kind of take us through the day. How, how did it go for you? I know you did a recap, by the way, like shout out your YouTube channel. Um, I watch your videos and stuff like that's where you get out of your shell a little bit um and and kind of show off your personality a little bit more um and I, I did watch your recap and everything on there but for people who haven't seen that give us like a little bit of a recap like how Austin went for you this year so as I said before I had an injury I sustained I think it was like maybe in December is when I started noticing it and then it didn't get any better um it was my hamstring and glute and I had um I was starting to have a hard time deadlifting and then it went from you know it, it was, it went from affecting my training to getting worse to affecting my daily life. You know, if there was something on the ground, I had to pick it up. I'm like, Oh, my leg, my, my hamstring, my, it hurts. Yeah. And then the flight over there because I'm in Japan had, you know, but 23 hour travel time, just yeah. sitting on the plane, it was very uncomfortable. So going into the meet, I wasn't too sure as to what I was um, going to be able to do. And that's another reason why I was really happy because the meet was going so well. So I think the Friday before, uh, the 
because I compete on Sunday. That Friday, I just sat on my um, foam roller and I really tried to get the knot out because I think it was a knot. And I got it out and I was sore on Saturday. So going to the meet on Sunday, I wasn't sure as to what was going to happen. And so um, during warmups, warmups felt, they felt okay. You know, they never feel good for me. It's always, oh, I think it moves slow, but that's just on me. Everyone, you know, my handler, uh, my brother, and then I had Gene Bell too. They were like, it moved all right, stop tripping, right? So after uh, my final squat warmup, I went out and did my first squat and everything felt really good. My leg felt normal and I was really excited about it because I'm like, okay, well, if it keeps feeling good, then I know that deadlift is going to be okay. So in training, I could pull 455 and that moved pretty well, but I'll load 500 on the bar and 500 wouldn't move. And for me, 500 is something that is, you know, a normal weight to move. I know it's a lot of weight, but yep. it's something that's normal um, and it wouldn't move. And so I hadn't pulled five in like a couple of weeks. So anyways, back to squat. Did my second attempt. I was really happy about that. I think I tied my PR and then my brother put in for my third attempt. I didn't know what it was. I told him, don't tell me. And I did it. And then after you told me what it was, it's like, this meat is going to be amazing because my hamstring, my glute don't hurt. Like I'm not affected right now by this injury. Um, went into bench. It's Wait, hold on. Bench. So before we move on to squat uh, from squat. So, okay. so yeah. So I just like did like a quick glance. Um, your previous best before that uh, at worlds you did 195 kilos mm -hmm. yeah um, so i'm just like we was talking kilos um and and then you did the 192.5 um for your second in austin mm -hmm. so it was right below your it was right below your competition best um and you had done 195 a couple of times um looks like um raw nats in in florida i think it's probably this is probably daytona raw nats yeah. you had done a 195 there as well um so but still your brother <laughs> you're like uh this is feeling good and you're telling him hey put yeah, in something full sin yeah full and sin then, and then so did you guys have 202.5 written down somewhere or he just uh, yeah out of this? because so uh ross lepola he's my coach from reactive yeah. training systems that was one of the uh one of the plans but i okay. told my brother i was feeling really really good just full sin whatever it was yeah. And he did. He put what was it? 202. 202 and a half. Yeah. He put that on there. And, and after I jump. did it, yeah. After I did it, <laughs> I was like, well, how much was that? Was that my PR? Because I wasn't really paying attention. And he was like, yeah, that was two. I was like, two? <laughs> okay. And that's when I got really, really, really excited about the meet because I was hitting PRs. 202 and a half. Yeah. It's pretty amazing. I've never, <laughs> never hit that before. I think my all time like a number that I wanted to hit was 200. So okay. to hit 202 and a half, I was, so one ninety. I was on cloud nine. So that is so awesome. Like, and so 195 was your competition best. Was that your overall, like even your gym best PR and stuff? Uh, I think my gym best, um, switching over to pounds was 460 at the time. Okay. So you've done a little more. Yeah. But that was in a, that was when I was in a different weight class too. Yeah. Okay. But for okay. competition, I wanted to hit one kilos, 200, 440. Man, that's um, <clears throat> a seven and a half kilo PR competition PR is what mm -hmm. I think you got that there. I mean, that's pretty wild. Like a lot of people go for two and a half kilo PRs, you yeah. know? And um, so like, if you had picked your number yourself, you probably would have gone way more conservative, but having, Definitely. Your, brother, Definitely. having your brother who's there, who like really believes in you yeah. and, and is a, a little more objective, probably going to put a little more on the bar, like, like then, and then he probably mm -hmm. should have, but um, how did that 202.5 move? I seem to remember, I think it was kind of a grind. It was, it was definitely slow, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. Um, yeah. But the whole time I was doing it, well, when I unracked it, I'm like, man, this is heavy. Don't think about it. I got the command. And instead of, you know, thinking about how much weight it is or trying to listen to the announcer, I just squat it. And it's like, well, I have to stand up now. If I don't, you know, I, I don't want to fail this. So just to push through it and just to grind through it and and get it. Yeah. Whether if, if I would have gotten red lights, I still think I would have been happy with it because I stood up with it. Yeah. Yeah. 
but you know, always aiming for the white lights. But you know, because it was a good lift, I'm good with it. I guess still makes me happy, right? Oh <laughs> it's yeah. Still, I still think about it. Oh, I can't believe I just did that. I can see it on your face right now. Um, yeah. <laughs> you're smiling just talking about yeah. it. Yeah. Um, and I remember it happening in real life, and um, I think I remember your opener. Maybe it was, and and you came off the platform, and you're like, "Yes, let's go." Like you were like you were like we're on one. You, you said something, I, I forget what exactly what it was that you said, but you're like, we're going to have a day today. I remember, yeah. feel, I remember feeling that right after my hamstring opened. wasn't hurting because yeah. in, in training after I would, you know, during squats, my hamstring was hurting. I'm like, okay, well, maybe I should stop. Maybe I should slow down. Maybe I shouldn't put all this weight on the bar, but in the competition, it just, it did. It, I wasn't, I didn't feel it. So mm-hmm. that's why I didn't, because I didn't feel my hamstring. That's why I started feeling the meat. Yeah. 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 And I, I think it was right away. I think it was right after your opener. I'll have to go back and look at the footage, but I think it was right after your opener, you came off and you're just like, you were like rev- revved up and ready to go. You're like, this is awesome. So, um, and I mean, you're kind of, you're a grinder anyway, like you, you grind on deadlifts on squats. Like I see you in training, you're doing, um, reps on squats and like your last rep will sometimes be like a big grind. So like it, I, when I was saying that it was slow, it was like kind of, just grinder slow, you know, like, like in that sense of like, it didn't look like anything too, super out of the ordinary for you. Um, mm-hmm. cause I've seen you grind squats like that deadlifts and stuff like that, especially. So it seemed cool. It seemed like, you know, it was all good for you, but yeah, yeah that was, just that was stick with it. And I mean, uh, Mike T said something in the press conference afterwards, uh, like, you know, it's always fun when it moves slow enough that you can think about it. And so like, you kind of took us through that whole thought process. Like, (laughs) I love that. It's like, it's like the world slows down, you know, it does. The world does slow down on the platform. You think you're moving super fast and you look at the video and you're like, Oh, that was, that was really slow, but it felt good. But like a million things are going through your mind and you're fighting and like, it just seems like everyone has that experience. Even if you're like really bad powerlifter, like myself, like when you hit PRs or you have like grinds, you know, and you just stick with it and, and you have your people there that telling you, just keep pushing, keep pushing. And you push through and you have all this time to like, think about, like you said, Oh, uh, well, I went down with it. I better, I better stand up now. You know, yeah. I better get back up. You have the time to think of that stuff, man. That's how, you know, that was like a hell of an attempt, you know? Yeah. So that's really okay. cool. So then, okay, go into a uh, bench for us where you went, you went two for three on bench, um, 92.5, you open with, you hit a 100 kilo and then you miss 102.5. So tell us just in general about your bench. Cause you're an amazing deadlifter. I hate bench. No, I don't, <laughs> I don't hate bench. I'm, I'm trying to reframe my mindset. It's not my best lift. So it, I have to pay more attention to bench than a deadlift or a squat. So I don't want to say that I hate it but it's not my favorite. Yeah. But, um, going in a bench, you know, it's the bridge to deadlift. So I have to do it. I have to at least make one attempt. But like I said, I'm trying to reframe my mindset so that it's not, you know, a big, you know, I'm not trying to think of it as a burden. I'm just trying to think of it just, you know, this is the opportunity to add, you know, a few more kilos to my total. Totally. So going in a bench, it was, was bench you know i don't really yeah. have any thoughts or things on yeah yeah, 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 yeah. Um, um you and me are very similar in our like our, to, like my deadlift too was like like way out of proportion to my squat mm-hmm. and my bench like long arm club um and, but i actually enjoy benching like i think it's like fun i actually think it's super fun to do like in the gym i like it I'm trying to that's what i'm trying to do i'm trying yeah. to get hey, in that bench today yeah even though it's embarrassing um it like, is it's so embarrassing have, yeah, yeah you have this great deadlift we have a a decent squat and then it's just like bench it's like, and you right. actually have to do it in public at a gym i can <laughs> do it in my in my garage like no one has to watch yeah. the kind of like lightweight stuff i'm doing um yeah. but, but but i do you do get that feeling when you're in a gym and people are kind of watching you're like they're like looking at your bench and like wow this is really pretty bad at bench and then yeah like, wait hold on let me you want to see my like my deadlift warm up is like probably more than your max like so yeah you know what i mean so it's like <laughs> i don't know but, but go ahead yeah so going in a bench um i think it was nationals 21 in, in daytona or so yeah 21 yeah yeah um 
that was probably the most embarrassing bench that I've had. What was it? What happened? A 92.5 is what you finished with. You missed a 95. Yeah. And I've never, it was because I wasn't really training bench because I hated it so much. I'm like, it'll be there on meet day. Or when I would train it, I, even though I do have a coach, I would look at the program as a suggestion for bench. And I'll say, okay, well, this is what I'm going to do instead. I'm just yeah. going to try to max out. So after, after that meet, I said, I don't ever want to have, you know, uh, a bench session, uh, you know, and a meet like that ever again. So I started training bench and it got better. And then, and uh, Austin was pretty satisfied, you know, where it was at, you know, for what I can do. And so I went into the first attempt. I was like, okay, well, that it didn't suck too much. And then my brother put in for my second attempt and I knew it was, what was it, 100? 100, yep. Yeah. I'm like, I'm about to do triple digit kilo bench. Let's go. And so yeah. I, uh, I benched it. And I was, you know, combined with the squat, that 202 and a half squat and 100 kilo bench, like I was having like the best day ever. And then to be able to share that experience with my brother, I was, yeah. I was like, this is, this is the ultimate, this is my best meet ever, regardless of whatever the total is. I'm having fun. I'm hitting, you know, kind of started hitting PRs and, um, or I'm, I'm loving the attempt selections. I'm loving the attempts. Yeah. And then I get to the third one and then, you know, just had to do a grind on that. And then I think I got called for up and down, okay. but I'm still happy that I had the opportunity to even have that as an attempt. Yeah. So, and not get pinned by it. Um, you know, right. you miss it on a technicality or whatever. Right. You still got it up. Like you said, Yeah. Um, that's, that's a little tough. Like when you're going uh, Cause I think I do, did remember seeing your second at a hundred kilos being like a little bit slow. And I was kind of thinking like, I don't know, like how much more she, she might not have or much more. And your brother probably feeling the same way, put in mm -hmm. a two and a half kilo increase to the third. Um, and so like you, you, at least, you know, you didn't really leave kilos out there, you mm -hmm. know? So it, that's always like a nice situation when you go up two and a half. Um, but, but yeah, like, and that 100 is your best, that's your bet that's a pr for you competition at at 76 yeah um, so i mean you're having a hell of a day you just yes. peered your squad by like seven and a half kilos you peed your pr your you peed your bench <laughs> you pr <laughs> your bench <laughs> uh i think by like five kilos yeah um at 76 that was a that's what happens oh, when you oh, do wait, your accessories. Sorry. two and a half kilos two and a half kilos but still yeah yeah so that's what happens so. when you do your accessories yeah so and, oh go ahead no i mean that's just amazing like you're you're already on like a 10 kilo pr day after mm -hmm. bench and then we know like the real fun starts after bench yeah well, like i said injured and i wasn't yeah. i wasn't too thrilled about going to the deadlifts because i didn't know what was going to happen mm -hmm. um so i had my last my last like training session, it was just, you know, just a bunch of warm ups. I think it was that Friday before. And then after that session, that's when I went home and got on the foam roller. But um, I actually misloaded the bar during that training session and I pulled more than what my opener was supposed to be. Uh oh, OK. Yeah. I told Ross and I sent him the video and he was like, well, I guess, <laughs> you know, you got to open with that now. Um, OK. So I told my brother, I'm like, I want to, you know, change my opener. And so we changed it to 217 and a half. Yeah. yeah. And um, then we went, I, that felt really good. Went up to 232 and a half. And I saw that the way that I felt, it felt like I could break the um, the deadlift record. The national record. Yes. So I felt like I could break that. Of course, the goal was to hit 561 to, you know, to be in, you know, automatic selection for the national team. Yeah. But I'm like, well, I'm going to just try to hit this deadlift record. Um, hamstring felt good. And I tried it and it just wasn't there for the day. But mm -hmm. overall, pretty happy with that experience. And with that meet, I think that was like the most fun I've had at a meet so far. That's so good to hear. And yeah, I mean it's a PR total for you at at, at uh, seventy six, even with 
kind of your biggest weapon being a little bit, you know, a l- lagging a little behind because of the hamstring because yeah. you're a conventional puller. Mm-hmm. And so hamstring is like super, super important, you know, mm-hmm. conventional, you're going to feel it right away. If you got a problem with you, with your hamstring yeah. um, and you walked away feeling good, no injuries, injury. Yeah. Felt- well, yeah. Felt good. Yeah, I've been feeling good since, you know, hamstring is. Yeah. Yeah. I love that when I see your posts and I see the update, you're like, you're like hamstrings doing good. It's hanging in hamstring there. Hamstring is, good. is, I would say is at a hundred percent right now, but that's you know. awesome. That's yeah. so awesome. And perfect timing. Cause you know, nationals is fun. Um, you weren't really challenged too much, um, at nationals, like you had to handle business, but, um, mm-hmm. and obviously you're, everyone was chasing those qualifying totals and stuff, Yeah. but we knew, I mean, everyone, you, you also knew coming in that those qualifying totals are super high and there's a lot of, uh, slots that were going to be open for, through the alternate pool. So, mm-hmm. um, it was kind of like no big deal. Um, I think right afterwards we were looking at the numbers and we're like, Dana's going to be in, um, <clears throat> And then it's good timing because now is when it really matters, you know, and where you're really going to be in like a multi-way battle um, for placing and you're going to be going against goats. Now, I haven't even looked um, at the nominations. Is Kimberly Walford back? Yeah, she is. So how is that experience like? Okay, so let's take them back then. Like we can talk about South Africa. Um, uh, Are you a fan of Kimberly? Like how how is it being around? Yeah, who would it be? (laughs) Yes. Yeah, I think she was the first person I saw powerlifting, I want to say, or one of the first people I started following on uh-huh. Facebook. And that's how long ago that was. And then um, I remember I was in Japan and um, well, the first time I was in Japan and I did a local meet. Uh, it was on base. And I was thinking, like, maybe one day I can deadlift like Kimberly Walford. Like, this was. 2016 I want to say oh wow yeah and um just you know one of those things or maybe you know one day I could be like this person that you know I follow on social media not really taking it serious not really thinking that that is going to go anywhere it's like okay I'm gonna do powerlifting you know this person is an elite person and then you know I just hope to emulate them one day yeah I didn't know I didn't know that I would actually get to go up against her so I've met her a few times. She's super nice. Mm-hmm. And um, when I saw that I was going to, when she was going to go 76, I was like, oh, this is going to be between her and Jess. I'm like, okay, yeah. this is going to be a lot of fun. And um, when I was going up against her, I'm like, this is so trippy because, you know, not saying that I don't still look up to her, but I was like, you know, this is somebody that I came into powerlifting you know wanting to be like and now I get to you know share a platform with and compete against it was that that was crazy that's you know that whenever I was watching and and you you're so similar in the sense of like um you deadlifts you know you're, you're deadlift specialists you know um and then like you you both have like kind of the long legs where like the squat like hers is like super like bent over, like look like a good good morning situation. Yours isn't as as much like that, but you know you're in the long leg club, long arm, mm-hmm. club. and so it's like you're so similar that it's like, how cool was it when you first found out about Kimberly Walford? Like like do you remember like when you first discovered her? Uh, when I first came across, like I don't even remember what the video was. It was so yeah. long ago, but I'm like, oh, people can do that. Women can do that. I didn't know that girls could lift that much. Yeah. And then um, I think, well, actually, yeah, I did message her on Facebook and she sent me a long message back. Like, I didn't, you replied to me and then I'm like, okay, I'm a fan for life. Wow. And then just to watch her and like, okay, well, maybe, you know, one day I can, you know, deadlift like her. And then I think it was Nationals 2017. Um, that was my first Nationals. That was like my first year in powerlifting. Mm-hmm. And I'm, you know, backstage this is prime time. And so all these people not following social media are within arm's reach. And then I see Kim and I'm like, she wasn't competing. Uh, I think she had maybe competed the night before or something, but I think she was doing some handling. But to see her, I'm like, oh, it's Kim. I could just go over there and say hi. But I didn't have a, you know, had a meet to do. Then yeah. after the meet, I saw her walking and I'm like, look, I just have to talk to you right now. I just have to say, you know, I'm a <laughs> huge fan. And she's like, I saw your deadlift and it just made me melt inside. I'm like, so like you oh. saw me? Oh my but, god! Um, but yeah, definitely a huge fan. Definitely a huge fan. 
And I can't wait to go back to Malta to go talk trash and <laughs> compete against her again. That is, that's a great story. Like, and um, just, she's such an amazing person. Like I, um, when we walked into the hotel in Panama for North American Powerlifting Championships, I was with our intern, Riley. And um, Riley is like new to the sport and everything, doesn't know who's who really at this point. And I was like, oh my God, I think that's Kimberly Walford. And I was like telling her, I was like, oh my God. And I was like, she's like, she's like the, the greatest of all time. Like she's mm-hmm. won the most championships, like never lost all this stuff. And, and so then I just like immediately went straight up to her and just was like, how's it going? Like, mm-hmm. I'm nice to meet you. Like, and she's like trying to <laughs> figure out some problem she had with her hotel, trying to get to the front desk or whatever. And I'm just bothered. <laughs> and every time she walks by, I'm just like, I'm just like, here, Kimberly, I'm like, I'm like following her around. Like, yeah. like <laughs> um, but then uh, throughout the course of that, that's a super long meet like worlds where it's like 10 days, all different weight classes and whatnot. And um, she coached, she refed. She was like sitting in the chair. She was like technical uh, controller. Like she was like, you know, doing so many different jobs. Um, she was sitting in, in, the, in like the, the, the meetings um, for the, the NAPF and like, you know, lobbying for USVI and stuff like this. And just mm-hmm. good to see her do everything. Like, mm-hmm. like um, the only thing she didn't do was lift. Um, and so it's really cool. Like she's one of those people in the sport that just, just like gives back way beyond like what anyone would ever expect of a person. Like you said, when you first messaged her on Facebook, she's like giving you a nice reply. She doesn't mm-hmm. know me from anybody. I'm just some annoying guy pestering her in the hotel. And then um, we ended up like getting to sit down at the bar and like have a nice long conversation and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, talk to her in the warm up room and whatnot. It's just an awesome person. I just, I was just pulling her up on good lift and it's just like um, on good lift system, which I'm not super familiar with there. Once you click on the athlete's name, it pulls up like their best five known ranks and it's all like one, 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 one. And it's Ridiculous. all world champion, world champion, world champion, world champion. And then you scroll through like these other results and other than her third place finish last year and her fifth place finish in Sweden, it's all ones from mm-hmm. top to bottom, you know? And then, um, after going through, you know, um, I think she's a master now and, mm-hmm. um, you know, going through what she went through in, in Sweden, not being a hundred percent. And then in South Africa, battling you for uh, the podium final spot there in third place. Um, she went and re you know, got herself another dub in, uh, at masters worlds in mm-hmm. Canada last year. And so obviously the M one division, she's about to just like totally destroy that division and just set like the bar up so high. So that'll be a fun one to shoot for whenever you age up into masters, you know, the years left <laughs> you get to battle or you get to battle. Yeah. Her. Yeah, that's surprising. Yeah. I I didn't realize that that yeah. I mean, then I'm old. <laughs> hey, I'm old. Says. I'm old. So don't go there. Uh, you're still young. You're still in your 30s. So. I still feel vibrant. But how old are you? What'd you say? 30. Hmm? How, how old are you? 38. 38. That's right. Okay, because yeah. it says it in here, 38. But you can never tell because sometimes it's like that's how old you were in February, and so yeah. Um. So yeah. So are you? Like now that you have this little taste of like going head to head against the goat, like you're going to go up and uh, challenge her at, in the master's division, maybe one day. Yeah, hopefully. I mean, I think it's fun. I think it's cool that, that, you know, you'll have open level competitors in the M ones. Yeah. I think yeah. masters as all these open competitors get older, if they stick with it, masters is going to be like, Stacked. I think people will start to pay attention to it a little yeah. bit more especially the m1s you know because yeah. 40 40 is really not that old i'm like you're yeah, still, really still young. young yeah um young, and youngish. So, like, what's that it's that youngish <laughs> it, 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 it's not old in real you know? life it's not old and in sports it's it's yeah you, know, you it's definitely there's more of a stigma of like mm-hmm. it's you feel old, especially trying to lift these kind of weights and stuff um but i think it, yeah she was a master last year when she finished in third so that's cool like That's masters are, are finishing yeah. on the podium in the open mm-hmm. and then obviously she's going and dominating over there and in ones but i'm sure she's like the ultimate competitor she would love mm-hmm. to have someone like you come up and uh have because then you have the stage all to yourself too it's like just yeah. that's what the whole story is dana versus kimberly head to head oh that's I'll be awesome there. Yeah. all right i'm gonna mark you down for that <clears throat> put it on your calendar <laughs> Definitely. I'll put it on my calendar. 
But um, so tell us a little bit about Worlds in South Africa. Um, this is your first World Championship. Um, just you know, give us a whole vibe of like what what was it like just being over there? Overwhelming, Overwhelming. nerve wracking, stressful. I didn't think I was any of those things until after I came out of it. I was like, wow, that was very very stressful. Um, Worlds is unlike any other meet that I've ever done. I thought being at nationals, it would have helped like, prepare me for worlds, but worlds, you, it's at nationals, it's still people there. Hey, come over here. Hey, do this. Okay, bars loaded. Um, you're, you know, so and so's on deck, so and so's in the hole. At worlds, you know, you're pretty much professional at that point. And it's, you know, if your meet starts at six, you know, that equipment check in and weigh-ins start two hours prior. They don't have to advertise that to tell you. So you just have to be where you need to be on time. Mm -hmm. So you have to know like how powerlifting works and, and be there. And then they don't tell you. Um, I think, well, maybe at, at like a national meet, you see all the competitors still maybe line up when it's their yeah. turn, you know, as they're waiting to go into the platform at Worlds. Everybody, from what I saw when I did look up, everybody was just kind of sort of like, you know, just wherever. And then next thing you know, Mike's coming up to me and saying, uh, we're going on next. What do you mean we're going on next? Why am I not standing up there? It's just kind of sort of like uh -huh. at Worlds, you definitely have to pay attention a little bit more um, to, to your surroundings and what's going on. And um, I don't think I was ready for that. I think I thought that, you know, I, I still wanted that, that, you know, not that helping hand, but maybe a sign or something, <laughs> you know, yeah. maybe, maybe a time as to, you know, where I was supposed to be at and you know but it was definitely stressful and then going out there on the platform I remember when they had set up the platform um I went to the venue and I saw it and I'm like oh crap I've seen this on tv and now that's where I'm about to perform and then like the sh my stress started going up a little bit and then um when we act when the meet started you know it's like you know I'm looking at all these amazing lifters and everybody is good at worlds nobody is there oh, okay well if this person misses their lift you know because you know everybody's making their lifts everyone's training is has been on point everyone's nutrition is solid so it's like you have to come in there on your a game and you can't just hope that somebody will you know oh maybe they won't hit depth today it's mm -hmm. like everybody everybody's gonna hit depth. every like I said everyone's a professional at this point like you make it yeah. to worlds you are amongst professionals you know people who've who've been in the game and who've done this many many times and so I think that became like a overwhelming factor for me because I'm like everybody's good you know mm -hmm. um, I'm a tall person and so whenever I walk into a room I'm used to being the tallest person I'm you know I'm also strong you know locally I'm used to being you know one of the stronger stronger mm -hmm. women around walking into into um into worlds it's like everybody's strong <laughs> like, yeah. and that's just kind of like dang I should really you know maybe I should have done that extra rep maybe I should have grinded out a little bit harder during training um but it was also a very rewarding experience because after it was all over and done with I'm like I want to go back I want to do it again throw me back into the, all the stresses again so yeah. I was ever since that last deadlift attempt at Worlds, I'm like, I want to come back. Where's it going to be at next year? I want to come back. I want to fight and I want to come back. So very stressful, but at the end, it was also very rewarding. And then just to see everybody, like, it's just like, it just gives me inspiration to work harder and try to do my best. Yeah. Because like you said, you're used to being like, pretty much the strongest person around you yeah um, I'm used to so, being like one of the outliers and then when I go into a situation and I'm not it's a weird feeling for me mm -hmm. and it's just like what do I do mm -hmm. it's like I can't you know everyone is strong you know or stronger than me and I'm not saying that as you know I'm not a strong person but if someone is lifting you know if someone's benching you know whatever I can't say well I mean I I can't say, you know, oh, well, I could do that one day, but that day should be today. But, yeah, exactly. Yeah. That, that day is today. Yeah. It's inspiring, it's just, like you said. Yeah, very inspiring. Makes yeah. me want to, it just shows you like, for me, it showed me what's possible for 
you know, women in sports, well, women in powerlifting, you know, that, you know, we can be very, very strong and, you know, we don't have to fit into a box, you know, like, don't lift this much, don't do that. When I'm competing with, you know, other people who defy those odds. Absolutely. Know? And especially in the 76, like you, you look at the, 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 the names that we've mentioned, mm-hmm. um, you got a lot of different like body types in mm-hmm. there too. Like, it's not just like one size fits all where everyone is right. like, you know, like traditional power lifter is like short and stocky, like short arms that I like, can bench press a ton or something like mm-hmm. that. And it's like, you got people like you, Kimberly, Jess, Agatha, Carlina now mm-hmm. in the mix and like all different types of people all have like different kind of leverages, different weapons. Mm-hmm. And so it's, it's just really cool. And I mean, I think like you were saying, it kind of like gives you the perspective too of like, okay, like this is what it takes if you want to be at this level with these. Right. Right. You have to be consistent. You can't just have one or two good days and then YOLO the rest of your training. You have to go into your training with the intent of doing better, of getting better. You have to take your recovery seriously. I said, I mentioned sleep earlier, but sleep is a big big part of recovery. Yeah. So making sure that you're getting enough sleep, making sure that your nutrition is on point because when it comes time to worlds, nobody else has been doing that. So yeah. it's like, if you want to even the playing field out as much as possible, you know, you have to train. Like, even though powerlifting is not a professional sport, it's a hobbyist sport, you have to train like a, like a professional. You know, you have to yeah. take it seriously. You can't just say, oh, it's just powerlifting. Oh, it'll be their meat day. I know I say it'll be their meat day, but I'm saying that in it, you know, as a joke, as but a joke. yeah, but you have to, you know, be consistent in your training, in your nutrition, in your recovery. And um, sometimes you can't go out and do the things that you want to do with your friends because you're like, oh, you have to be in bed by this time. It's like, oh, it's just powerlifting to you. It's just powerlifting to me. This is something that, you know, that it's a, it's a lifestyle for me. This is something that I enjoy doing and I want to be good at it. And I want to continue to be there amongst like the best people in the sport. And so, you know, I can't, you know, I can't sacrifice that right now. I can go with you next time, but not this time. Yeah, exactly. You're in the, you're in your prime. You're representing the USA. You're on a world's team. Um, Like you said, the power of the, I think we want the sport to be more professional. I think the athletes, are professionals you know like yes. they 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 treat it and i think you know they're the superstars and they're the you know you are the superstars and um you treat it like you you're working just as hard as a professional athlete but you don't have the benefit of having that be your sole focus in life that you right. actually have another job as well mm-hmm. so it's like even more you're almost more of a superhero in that sense because it's like you're balancing your whole day job along with being a world class world level competitor um and then like in your case, um, in the 76s, like I talked about this with Matt Gary on a previous episode where powerlifting now, the talent pool has risen so high that yeah. it's truly a sport now. It's not just the strongest person shows up and collects their bag, right? Mm-hmm. It's it's like you miss one lift, you put in the wrong number, you you know uh, have a technicality on your bench or whatever, boom, you yeah. lose. You could go from on the podium to off the podium yeah. with, with one lift. Um, and like, if you look at between you Agatha and Jess, you only miss two lifts. You miss your, you, you were eight for eight going into your final deadlift and you're pulling for the podium. Um, Agatha, she missed, a, missed her third bench and that was it. Three of you and Jess went nine for nine. And then now Kimberly, she has like a little bit of a different strategy. Like she's known for missing some squats. Like, you know, it's hard for her to get down to depth and stuff like that. So she missed three lifts, but still, um, <clears throat> so like you gotta hit, you gotta make lifts. You gotta be consistent. You gotta be on mm-hmm. your game. And then, so a little, another thing about your session at worlds was that was a rare one too, because on, for the U S team, we had two 93s in the same session. Um, so, and so I think the coaching staff was probably a little bit spread thin because mm-hmm. they're handling you and then they're handling uh chance and then they're handling Kaiko mm-hmm. all in the same session. And there's only two coaches, right? Um, like Rodney and Mike. So, um, and then, you know, personal coaches like Arian was there and other people were there as well. But, but um, so that was probably a pretty hectic session. What was that session like? Cause, and, and did you like compare to, did you go to any of the other sessions? I know you were helping out people like 
before and, and definitely after, I think I remember you coming in and helping out on, on the day that Mikey Davis was lifting and like helping. Yeah, I helped out on his day. I didn't yeah. help out before. I don't think anyone put in the chat that they needed help, but um, the day of the session, I didn't find it too chaotic because I had Mike there, Mike T and he was there. Oh. So yeah, he was, he was uh, my additional coach slash handler for the day. So it wasn't, it wasn't too bad for me. Yeah, I, I forgot that Mike T was there. Um, yeah. Was he there just, uh, he has a lot of coaches, uh, a lot of athletes from around the world. So he's handling multiple people, I guess, throughout the week. Yeah. yeah. So no, he was there for me. Yeah. Okay. I need, yeah. I asked, well, I didn't have to ask him. He yeah. was going to be there for me. Yeah. I'm That's an so RTS cool. athlete and he's the owner of RTS. So why not be there for your athletes? you better show up Mike T that's cool yeah. um like t like you you have like so many like brushes with legends here like you got Mike T as your as your game day coach he's like one of the greatest mm -hmm. he's the goat of coaching you're going against Kimberly you're in the most talked about session from worlds you know with a Jess and Agatha show so that was and stressful Chance and and uh Kaiko also yeah. in the same session. I mean, that was a like the I think that one I'm I'm guessing it was probably on their Eurosport. Probably yeah, had I think 20 it was. million, probably had like 20 million people watching you. Mm. No pressure. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I just like to just focus on on you know what I'm doing. Yeah. But yeah. Having Mike there was was great. I like working with him. I like when he's uh my handler because we always have like a good time. Because he handled you at um, the first at PA. The night. first one. Yeah. He didn't handle me at this last one, at the one earlier this year, because uh, he was lifting. He was, yeah, he was lifting. Yeah. In the same session, I believe. Right. Or, yeah. 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 The same session. Yeah. My exactly. brother was going to go there to watch and I'm like, can you handle me? And he said, yeah, of course. So yeah, but I always have a good time with Mike. Um, so I don't, I don't think I really felt like the pressure of the coaches um, being spread thin. Mm -hmm. or and I didn't didn't feel rushed by them maybe felt rushed by the meat but I didn't feel rushed by you know by the coaches or, or Mike or anything it was a it was a good meet good stress did it I think was it like kind of an electric atmosphere in that session like did you very feel like stuff was very going down? yeah very did much you, so and you weren't paying attention like you like uh, did you did you watch the, the end of the 93s and see the whole battle with Chance and Kaiko or not? I was I was watching it, but it wasn't registering at the time. I was still getting over like the session that I was just in. Yeah, yeah. But I think this next uh this next one coming up for Malta, I think I'm gonna take the time to watch the sessions a little bit more. Maybe not necessarily my session or what's going on in the 76s, but definitely like the other sessions, other sessions. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, I didn't, you can pull up the uh, calendar real quick and see um, what, what session I'm guessing you're going to have only 76s like this year, the schedule, there's so many lifters. Um, there's like so many more <laughs> so than before. Me. Yeah. And so here, I'll pull it up real quick while we're on the subject. Um, no, it's the same deal. You're in there. You'll be in there with, uh, a, the 93s. You'll, yeah. You'll be in a flight of eight and with, a, a, a in the same session with a eight of the 93s as well. So, and again, and this is this session, like no pressure or anything, but, um, yeah, this starts at 20 hundred. Yeah. I saw that <laughs> it, it was at 8 p.m. Eight o'clock. So my guess is what the deal is, is like, I know that's one of those primetime sessions that's going to be on Eurosport, which means I think I heard a number of 20 million. I'm just, I'm not good with math and numbers. It could be 200 mm. million. Who knows? But, um, Is it 200 million? I don't know. How many people are there in the world in Europe? I don't oh know. I don't know. Num numbers are going in one year and out the other with me. If it's not talking about the totals. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but, um, a ton of people, let's say on Eurosport, but, um, they want to make those like super quick sessions that are very watchable, that are super mm -hmm. exciting, like the best of the best, the top eight and top eight um, for 76s and 93s. It's starting at 8 p.m. Malta time, which is probably like in the UK. That's probably a little earlier because I think mm -hmm. they're a little further ahead in Malta. So that might be like, you know, 6 p.m. or 5 p.m. in the UK and, and France is for whatever, like 7 p.m., something like this. 
So it's like prime time. Like that's when everyone's sitting down to, you know, watch stuff on TV. So I think it's so cool. And then, I mean, again, it's like this time we throw Carlina in the mix. This time we throw Gavin in the mix. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, like what a session like that is going to be. be... It's going to be lit. It beyond what's what's after lit like what's a step above lit because that's what it's going to be it's just going to inferno inferno it's going to be an inferno session the whole platform is going to be on fire it's so much talent the yeah. and then yeah I, next year i can't even think about next year right now i gotta make it no. through this year who's gonna no. pop up next you know after this don't even think but, about it um, yeah i'm not i gotta focus let me the main Focusing Main thing on is, this year. you're pretty safe in the U.S., it seems. Um, I don't know off my head any 76s that are that are really, like, nipping at your heels to really challenge. Um, there might maybe be some. Not, like, maybe not in PA, but over in USAPL, you have uh, Jasmine Penn. Jasmine Penn, that's right. Yeah, yeah. She's, she's pretty strong. Well, not pretty strong. She's very strong. Yeah. Um, who else? Because what weight class there's is some, she? but they're they're just she's she's in the 75s. Okay, 75s. That's their thing. Yeah, okay, but I competed me. against her at Nationals 21. I think okay. I had fun at that one too, except for that bench. But um yeah. And then yeah, you did oh, good. Sure. Yeah, you finished in second there. Yes. So was that behind her? Yeah, that was behind her. Yeah, she's strong, she's super strong. Yeah. Super awesome. Um, yeah, if she comes over, you would have a challenger, but um, yeah, as far as um 76 is out there. That are NPA, no, there's there's not a lot. Uh... Not that I can think of off the top of my head. I mean, um and then I'm trying to think too, like I know we're gonna have we're gonna start having really good junior teams. Mm-hmm. Um, I think Jess Kinney is a 76 in the, mm-hmm. uh, yeah, the her, she was supposed to be she, at the first nationals. She's pretty badass. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. She was thinking about, um, she was thinking about coming to this last one too in Austin as well. Um, <clears throat> yeah, she'll, she's an up and comer. She'll be a challenge at some point. Um, and then yeah, if it's someone comes over, I mean, we'd love to have Jasmine come over and have like a full on 76 battle at PA Nats. That'd be fun. But in the meantime, it's cool. We could get to see plenty of competition at Worlds, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, but, yeah, just looking at the nominations here, there's 26 lifters. Uh, it, oh, one of those is a reserve, so 25 in your weight class. Like, that is that is awesome. Yeah, that is really awesome. Like, there's, there's a hell of a competition now at, at Worlds. That weight class in particular, 69s is huge, too. Um, yeah, 69s oh, yeah. has 32. Um, but I think those are the two, the two biggest ones. Um, 64 has 20 or is it over 20 20, or is it 22, 22 22, and and then, and then the, uh, 63s are sitting right at 27. So 27 for 63s, 32 for 69s, and then 26 for you in the seventies. That's the kind of the bell curve right there. It's like 63, 69 and 76 are where Mm -hmm. a lot of people are. So that is man, I'm pumped for you. That's going to be so exciting. You're going to be, people are going to know your name. They already know your name from worlds last year and everything, but like, they're going to know it even more after this one, because this world's just being like so much bigger. And, um, I know that I think, I don't know if it's like, I don't know the official details about it, but I just know that there's like TV deals in the works to get this in front of a lot of eyeballs. Um, and so, um, yeah, it'd probably be one of the most seen, sessions of all time in powerlifting so and our girl dana's in there and she'll be fighting for the podium so you know fight for the dub i mean you never know what's gonna happen no pressure no pressure your hamstrings feeling no good pressure. training's, hamstrings training's feeling going great. good phenomenal you can, pull, you can pull a billion maybe you know a couple billion and then pff, their deadlift just ice it no one ever everyone will be talking like oh my god no one saw dana coming in so, the shadows Look with it. her <laughs> hex plates um and whatnot all right well anything okay so like following finishing up on the south africa kind of conversation and everything um you had a hell of a performance like just any other details like that you can remember about like what was it like like when you guys was it you and mike t deciding what to put on the bar for that final deadlift and you guys were trying to pull to to beat kimberly and take mm-hmm. that podium spot yeah yeah it, 
just yeah so he was like we can put this on the bar and then that'll pull you into into third um I think you could do it I said okay Mike I took my headphones out I said okay whatever (laughs) I put my headphones (laughs) back in and then uh I went out there and I tried not to pay attention to the announcers normally after I've already come up to the bar I've already you know blank everything else out except for the head ref Mm -hmm. um but my peripheral vision was working just fine. I could see everything. I'm like, come on now. I need to focus on, on this lift. It's yeah. the last lift. It's Worlds. And then I looked at the um, at the board and it said WR. I said, whoa, record. And I just started thinking. I think I started thinking too much. And then I went there and I'm like, I'm looking at the bar. Might as well just try to pull it. And I, I tried and then I had much gas left in the tank. But yeah, that was pretty much the plan. Mike was like, hey, look, this is what we can do. Get you in a third. All right, Mike, go ahead, put it down. I don't, whatever you think, I'll, I'll do it. And then I didn't do it, but you know. You know, tell us, like, I'm trying to recall the deadlift and you never just like straight up miss, like it didn't, it came off the floor, right? Yeah, I think I got it halfway up my shin. Yeah. And then I had nothing left. I couldn't, that's all I had. I couldn't give think, it anymore. Do you think it was like the speed of the meet that was, um, you know, catching you a little bit off guard or you think you Maybe. just kind of got I into think, your head? Cause you've pulled that, like you pulled. So that was 245. No, that was, okay. It was 252, and 252 yeah, no. and a half. So, I mean, you pulled it at 84. Um, you pulled, you pulled two, you, you've pulled more than that before at 84, right, but at that would have been. That no, I was equipped. A... That was an equipped deadlift. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. So, so that was that was an all time PR then. Um, yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, I mean, but still, is only is only like ten kilos above your second. The fact that I even got to you know pull it and it made it halfway. So there was lessons learned from that. So hopefully, that won't be a a hindrance this coming week. Yeah, two fifty two point five is right there. Um, I was just looking at these numbers and it you said that you're right. I mean, you were pulling second to last. Um, you're pulling, you know, everyone is watching you uh, on this because, you know, you got Jess coming up right behind you mm-hmm. and she had just pulled a world record 249. You went, you guys went way above and beyond. You went 252.5. Like you could have easily just done 249.5, like try to chip that world record. But like you said, you weren't pull, you weren't just trying to get a world record deadlift like you were trying mm-hmm. to get on the podium on the podium and to beat the goat right like that is crazy like that is such an awesome thing to be like it's a bump, surreal feeling bump yeah. kimberly like like we love her but like bump her off the podium and put dana mcneil on there yeah. and give her the bronze medal um that's so exciting i'm getting goosebumps just thinking about it um but yeah i could see now now that i'm uh because it, cause when you're looking at open power thing and you just see 252.5, you don't you don't think that's a world record because it's not like 253 or it's not 252. Uh-huh. It's not like a weird number. Um, but yeah, that was a world record pull um, because I'm seeing that Jess's 249 was a world was a world record, I think, or at least it was a world record total. But yeah, yeah it was that's a world record pull. I'm I think it sure. was. I think yeah, because yeah, yeah, I know for a fact her 260, yeah, 249 has to be a world record. Mm-hmm. That's a weird, that's a weird number. Yeah. And then, uh, and then yeah, 261.5, um, it was the biggest deadlift in, by any woman in history. I mean, you are, you're right there. And then now of course, you know, our girl, Amanda has gone and, on that um, door to 68.5 yeah. at Sheffield. So she yeah. said, Oh, you, you think you got the biggest deadlift in the history of mm-hmm. women's powerlifting? No, I have it. It's 268.5 now. And, um, that, that record's never going back to a 76 again. Um, that's going to be too, that's Amanda's now, but, yeah. um, but let's see, I mean, you're, you're right in there. So that'll be fun and exciting. Um, and like you'll be pulling damn near dead last again. We'll see how justice health is everything, but you'll be right in that mix. So that's fun. That's really fun and exciting times. Um, you know, what was it like, you know, coming off of that and then, like, did you talk to Kimberly? You shake hands and um, say yeah. good job because you pulled your second was two forty two point five. That was her third, um, and so like, hey, you're up like 
this your idol that you've been looking up to for so long and yeah. you're like oh my god she's got this deadlift that and then here you both are at worlds you're hitting her third deadlift on your second um god that had to be just like so it surreal was, after everything was said and done i think i think we did either we either hugged or shook hands there was so much going on after yeah. right right after the session but i know that after the banquet we all hung out so i was with um part of the usbi team uh at the banquet well after after we ate and then um i think everybody moved back to the hotel and it was like this little club at the hotel and we all just kind of hung out there so i got to talk to her some more and it was just like we got to talk trash more and i like talking trash with people but uh it was it was like a surreal thing and it was it was a lot of fun and i can't wait to do it again yeah. Yeah. She really lives up, you know, in real life. Um, you know, some people don't, and, um, she's a, such a real one where it's like, she doesn't disappoint when you meet her in real life that she's so <laughs> awesome. Um, uh, give us a little bit more about the overall experience. Like how were the hotels, how was the travel and all that kind of stuff? Um, and yeah, like, like you sound, sound sounds like you said there was like a little club in there or something that was going, fun to go to. Going to worlds. Um, so the travel, the travel to worlds wasn't bad. Um, used to long flights when I first started powerlifting I lived in Alaska so I was always coming like the furthest away um so I'm kind of used to always having you know to come the furthest distance to go do a meet but the travel wasn't that bad um pretty standard you know um a lot of people complain a lot of people were complaining about that uh bus ride or van ride. yeah the bus ride was a little different um I was riding on the bus I think we got there at night, got, got there the same time as Team Japan. It wasn't planned. And oh. um, just on the bus and just on the bus for a really long time, my phone didn't work. I didn't have a SIM card. So I had nothing to look at except, you know, out in the darkness and then hope that we're actually going to the uh, the resort. So we get there. Um, the hotel was nice uh, for what it was. It, hotel was nice. And um, I think it had like a hard rock cafe in there and it had like a bunch of different restaurants. And yes, there was a club in there. Um, I didn't go to it until the very, very end, like right after the banquet. Mm-hmm. But the accommodations were decent. Um, the food was the food was good. Um, they served uh, breakfast in the morning and the breakfast was like this huge spread. So just think of like, you know, you have egg stations, you have pancake stations, waffle stations, um, different food from other parts of the world, because you have a whole bunch of different people, um, at that hotel. So you have, you know, different foods that you may have seen before, may not have seen before for breakfast. And then like for lunch, I would just have, you know, maybe maybe like a salad from, um, hard rock, you know, maybe a steak or something like that. And, um, yeah, overall, the accommodations, like I said, were decent. And the only thing I didn't like was that we were just so far away from the main city that we couldn't, it wasn't like a quick Uber ride to, you know, go to Johannesburg and go explore. It was you know, two hours away. That was that, if anything, that would be my only complaint. But they had a lot of stuff for us. There was a lot of stuff for us to do. Like I went on a zip lining. Oh, cool. uh, I think the line was like two kilometers long. And you're laying down. So did some zip lining. Um, there was a safari. I know that there was ATVs. There was like just a little bit of everything. So yeah. it really kept you engaged. But out of everything, like I said, my only complaint would be we were just so far away from the city that, you know, it's two hours there. And then, you know, if you want to look around, yeah. get lost and then, you know, come back, you know, another two hours. And you did four hours of driving. I'm assuming you did not do that. No, I didn't. No, okay. I just stayed, I just stayed at the, uh, was it a resort? Yeah, I stayed at the resort. At the resort, yeah. Yeah, yeah. it's kind of like an all-inclusive sort of like little community yeah. that they had you in, which is cool in, in, in some ways. But like you said, if you're like an adventurous person like you are who likes to travel and have been to like a lot of major cities around the world and stuff like that, then it's like, it's kind of a shame you don't get to like spend any time in Joburg and kind of see the local vibes and like, see what's going yeah. on. Cause that's always a fun thing to do about traveling. Mm-hmm. Did you get to do that on the, on the back end or anything like that? Or no, you had to fly. No, I think I just went straight home afterwards. You're always tired at the end. It's hard to do, yeah. do the 
tourist thing after everything. Yeah. Um, it's way easier on the front end when you're all excited to get there and everything. Yeah. But um, but that's cool. Um, and how was like the team team vibe, you know, like being on Team USA? Like um, I I remember vividly there was like something was going on and they needed someone to come and help like load plates in the warm-up room for Mikey. I think it was for Mikey yeah. Davis's session or him. Was him and Lugo were in there together? Yeah. <clears throat> and I know Mikey had been helping out a ton mm-hmm. in the previous days and stuff like that. So so yeah, I mean, how was like kind of the team team spirit? Team spirit seemed like team spirit was was really good. Seemed like everybody was in like good spirits about everything. Um the group chat was there was always something going on in the group chat. Yeah. yeah. But um yeah, when they texted that they needed help, my session was done and I wasn't doing anything. Like, well, I was just going to go watch, but if they need help, you know, I'll go there and I'll help. So that's what I did. Um, yeah, this team uh, going to Malta seems pretty solid as well in terms of like chemistry. Yeah. Yeah. They're all it, strong, but in terms of chemistry, they seem like, you know, seem like a really tight knit group. And that, that's really cool um, to see that with you guys, um, because obviously, like, as a social media person and stuff, like, I'm, I'm like, behind the scenes working with you. That's how Bonica made me one of the team shirts yeah. from last year and stuff, because I was I was back here in the command center mm-hmm. uh, <laughs> doing things. But um, it's really cool, you know, because you're, you're all head-to-head competitors, and you're all individuals, and you got your personal coaches and everything like that, but you all have the same USA, you right. know, across the chest, and you're all, like you want each other to win, even though you may not even be friends or you may not even really right. know these people very much. Like you're, you're definitely like an outsider because you're, you live in Japan and stuff. So you're not at all these meets. Like a lot of people get to see each other more frequently and stuff like that. Um, but it's really cool. And then this year, the team is very kind of the same team. Um, it's like only a couple of people gone and a couple of new mm-hmm. people fit in. And so I think it'll probably even feel like now, like this will be your second world. So you'll be kind of like a little bit more of an OG veteran that can help out the new, the new. No, people. hardly. Have you seen well, the team? These people hey, well, sec- multiple, multiple championships. Yeah, I know. We, about. Yeah. Yeah. Like Bonica's in there, obviously she's got the most experience of anyone, but, um, but you know, like, like that whole thing that you went through last year, like you said, when I asked you what, what it was like, you just said overwhelming, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, you hear this in sports talk a lot about, we were kind of talked about a little bit where it's like when you get to a certain level, like the, the game slows down a little bit mm-hmm. and you get that experience. And that's probably the way you're going to feel at this world is that it's going to be a little slower. It's not going to be as crazy and overwhelming yeah. as it was the first time. And that's um, what I'm hoping. I'm hoping too. And, yeah. uh, and then the same thing, like, you know, with the whole team kind of going back again and stuff, like you kind of know each other a little better. Now you have a little bit of personalities, you know, who likes to eat what, like make sure to let someone know where the good restaurant is or whatever. Mm-hmm. So, um, and I mean, it sounded like, like you were showing up to cheer. I know, um, uh, Bonica showed up a lot and like Jonathan Garcia, like some, some of these people would show up and cheer for the other lifters. There's family members in town as well. Like, do you have any family that travels to this kind of stuff? Uh, my parents have been to a couple of meets. Um, my brother went to this last one. Uh, they haven't been to, um, a world's yet. So, uh, maybe one day I know that they were making plans, but you know, things happen. So yeah. I know, I know that they'll be watching. Totally. And then my parents, they love texting me during meets. <laughs> Put my phone on, <laughs> do not disturb. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but when I get a chance, I, I always mes- message them back or I'll call them um, in between sessions or yeah, in between lifts. But um, yes, my coworkers. So uh, when I did worlds last year, they said, if you go back, let us know. And we'll be there. I said, okay, you know, not believing them. And then I told them after nationals, um, after I found out I was on the team, I'm like, hey, I'm going to Malta. And they got on the computer and they're like, okay, well, we can get flights. We can do this. We can do that. You know, stay at this hotel. Uh, We could do this afterwards. And I'm like, okay. I didn't really believe it until I saw screenshots of receipts. And I said, you guys are really going. So um, I'll have a support system there, which was, which is like, super super amazing like I still like look at my coworker. Oh, I can't believe you're going he's yeah. like why wouldn't I go I'm like why would you go but it's he's big, like I want to see you lift it's a big like, investment but it's yeah. a cool place I think yeah. and it's and it's not like 
South Africa is also really cool. Like I would have loved to have been there. Um, but like with the resort and everything and like, you don't really get to experience like it's not in like a major city. So this has a little more tourism kind of attraction mm -hmm. to it. I feel like, yeah. and it's a little more, you know, vacation, uh, friendly, like Island destination, whatever. Um, so I could kind of see people, but that's cool. We're going to have a huge squad this time. Like we're bringing more refs. We're bringing more officials. Like we got, I'm going, we're bringing Tamara as an extra coach. Mm -hmm. Um, so like, we're going to have team USA, like represented in there big time. You know, we got a full, completely full team. You know, some people will be bringing their parents and stuff. So they kind of mm -hmm. like part, like honorary parts of the team yeah. um, and stuff like that. And so like, I think it'll be like awesome. I think we're going to have yeah. like a big cheering section this time and everything. So should be good. Um, be okay. Okay, so I I don't want to keep you too much longer because I know we're damn it's so I'm crazy how these just go oh, by gosh. so fast. But um let's uh quickly kind of give us a little bit of a rundown of how training's going. Like as you know from the group chat, don't tell anyone your secrets, but like how are you feeling? How I mean you kind of already said the hamstring's feeling good, mm -hmm. you know, your deadlift's ready to go off. Um, like you think you're gonna hit PR total? Yeah, I think so. Okay, because we can I say think that so. safely. I yeah. think most people are planning on hitting PR totals, right? Training's been going very well. I'm surprised at how well training's been going. Um, I was talking to Ross, and he's like, your training's going off. And I said, I know. And so that was <laughs> just the, uh, I'm doing a deload this week. But when I start up meat prep, I'm, I think I'm more excited about meat prep this time around than I have been in the past because of how well training has been going Um hitting PRs and I'm like and then the PRs start to become a little bit easier mm -hmm. to hit you know as each um like every couple of weeks and it's like okay I guess this is progress you know yeah. but yeah, everything is feeling really really good and um I'm really happy with where training's at right now mm -hmm. I can't wait for that to transfer over into the platform because it doesn't matter what you're doing it, it does matter what you do in the gym but it needs to all be put together on the platform and you're used to traveling like you have to travel like crazy just to get to u.s nationals and stuff so mm -hmm. like you're like one of those one the outlier types where like you could actually pr your total at worlds where a lot of people don't because it's just like everyone i think there's a statistic floating around out there that's like most people do like around five percent worse at IPF mm. worlds than their best total. And it's just because of the competition, the travel, like eating weird stuff, like just yeah. all the things that we've been talking about, but you just do that stuff so frequently anyway, mm -hmm. like with your traveling that um, you're used to it. So I think that's, that's a kind of a secret weapon for you is that you actually can PR your total. Yeah. I and, did nationals for the international national meet. I just did. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> and that was, again, like we said, that was with your biggest weapon kind of, uh, you know, still in the hangar. Yeah. Um, and so, um, yeah, but I mean, that's it, tell like your coach is Ross mm -hmm. reactive. And then Pia is the name of your nutritionist. Is that right? Yeah. Yes. And what's her Instagram off the top of your head? I know you. Uh, Pia Maragoni, I believe M A R. Oh, sorry, real quick. Get... No, it's all right. Lying. We can. I know you tag her um, in all your posts now and what as well. I got to remember to tag her in the stories whenever I post your stuff, repost your stuff into the stories. Yeah, yeah, I was right. M A R A N G O N I, Pierre Maragoni. But if you go to the Fiercely Fueled Nutrition um, Instagram page, she should be on there. And how did you find her? Through Mike. Okay. So Mike was being. Uh, he, his nutritionist was Dr. Kristen Lander. And I just remember him posting about her all the time. And then when I was in Austin, I met up with him and John over at their Airbnb for some RTS stuff. And he was just talking about Kristen. And I'm like, well, if Mike is finding success with nutrition, being, you know, um, someone who's been in powerlifting for a really long time, then it could probably benefit me. So I reached out to her and then she was like, well, he is, she's from South Africa and she'll be at Nash, she'll be at Worlds. Oh. And so I met up with her at Worlds. And so we talked and then we just started working together. So. Okay. Yeah. So it's been almost a year then. Yes. All right. Well, it's no surprise in that you feel like your lifts are kind of popping off right now. You're getting more sleep. You're fueled up better. Mm -hmm. um, so how do you, you know, you have Ross who like, he does your programming. 
do you, do you interact a lot with Mike T still? Like, does he review like a lot of your videos when you post them on social media and stuff? And no, well, if it's something like if I say, oh, this is a PR and he, and he sees a video, he, he'll message me. But for the most part, I just work with Ross. And then as I get closer to a meet, then um, I'll add Mike to uh, the videos that, um, that I send to Ross. Okay. And is that all through like the RTS? coaching system and everything like that like where you send videos and, and whatnot uh send videos on google drive okay gotcha yeah i used to upload them as unlisted on youtube but then i started having some problems with that so then i just put them on google drive okay and then i just um, add i just add mike and how is are you in because like i RTS is like such a cool thing. Like, I, mm -hmm. I mean, they're like the OGs. Like, Mike is like the godfather of all powerlifting coaching, it seems. Um, and, you know, even though he's he's still young and an open lifter and everything like this, yeah. he's he's kind of like the grandfather in some ways, too. Um, how is it just working with them? Uh, and like, are you in? I know they have like this RTS classroom. Mm -hmm. and they have things where you can like check in and they have office hours and stuff like yeah. this going on. Do you, do you tune in to that kind of stuff? Do you have access to that? Kind of stuff or yeah, I have access to it. Sometimes I'll tune in, uh, depending on what the office hour was. I know for the nutrition one, I was definitely tuning into that. And that's also what, because, uh, Mike was saying how much success he was having with, uh, with, uh, Dr. Lander. I wanted to check out her, her nutrition hour. I'm like, okay, well, you know, she doesn't, she sounds like she knows what she's talking about. Yeah. And um, yeah, so I've, I've checked in with some of that stuff. Um, but yeah, they have a vast network of a lot of stuff, um, a lot of coaching techniques and and tips and tricks and, and all that. Sometimes it's overwhelming because they're also very technical. They're in this powerlifting space. You know, this is what they do. And so sometimes some of the terminology they use, I'm just like, it's over my head, but it's also it's very cool to listen to them talk and to be so passionate about lifting and, you know, all the small technicalities that go along with that. Yeah. Like they're all in for sure. Like this is their definitely life. This is yeah. their life and everything. So I've always, I was thinking about signing up in uh, for the classroom stuff, just to learn more about mm -hmm. you know the sport and like learning from the, some of the greats of all time in the sport, you know, and stuff like that. Um, I think they, they just seem, do you, when you're in South Africa, cause I know, Mike, <clears throat> he coaches some other athletes too that are on other teams. Like, mm -hmm. um, there's the guy um, from the Swedish team, the 74, Alexander Erickson. I believe he coaches him, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so, did you guys, did you guys like feel like you're a team? Is there like any kind of like little bit of a team vibe going on there? I know RTS is so big and people yeah. are like so like somewhat loosely associated with it you know, here and there, they might not be getting coached directly by Mike. And so, but how, how does that feel like when you're at the international meet? Um, I wouldn't say, well, me personally, I'm not that close with any of the other RTS athletes. And that's not just because, you know, whatever, it's just, I'm just reserved, reserved person by yeah. nature anyways. But, um, if they're tagged in a post, you know, and if I see them out, you know, if I give enough courage, I'll, I'll go over and say hi. Yeah. And uh, do people come up to you and, you know, same kind of thing, like, hey, what's up, like Team RTS? Yeah. That's cool. There's just some camaraderie to it. There's like little subsects within the sport. Obviously, mm -hmm. Team USA, you know, that's what we're repping. But it's, uh, mm -hmm. but it's cool to see that, like, you know, we got Mike T, you're, because he's with you. He's like on our squad. Uh, mm -hmm. He's also got people on others. So it's kind of cool to bring people in and like meet people from other teams like they do like i see a lot of people do like t-shirt swaps and like you know, yeah. jersey, like they do after football game jersey swaps and stuff so yeah. it's, it's, a, it's such a cool sport i i'm excited to go to malta and see how um the the you know the big the big show is all right so let's um just run through a couple of quick hitters that i always like to finish off with and we'll we'll wrap this up and i think i'm Thank you so much for staying on and not kicking me off of here because I know you're getting tired of sitting. Uh, <laughs> so we already hit it. What's your day job? Um, say the title again, though, just so I have it. Uh, crew chief. Crew chief. That's right. Yes. Um, that reminds me a lot. Like I've been watching this Formula One documentary. Have you been watching that? No, I think it? I know where you're going. Yeah. Crew chief, man. Yeah. Like that's, you know, it's like pit crew stuff. Like, and Yours is like more serious and even more hardcore than even like F1 stuff. Um, but um, 
where did you grow up? You you said Maryland is your that's what you yeah. consider, but you really mm-hmm. I mean you spend time in I grew up everywhere. States. Maryland, Minnesota, Virginia, Colorado. A little bit of everywhere. And then oh, where? For, oh, when since I joined the military, Georgia, England, Japan, Alaska, and back to Japan. Okay, so Alaska is where you were right before you went to Japan. Mm-hmm. Wow, that's like crazy uh, difference in like climate and you know everything, like opposite yeah. side of the world and everything too. Yeah. Oh, did you like Alaska? What did you think? Alaska about? was nice. I really liked it. I was I was kind of upset that I had to move again because I really wanted to just stay there. But Alaska was really nice. In terms of like, okay, yeah, you have the cold winters, but you get used to it. Um, yeah, I enjoyed my time in Alaska. What city were you in? I was in Anchorage. Okay, so like real, a uh, pretty yeah. It didn't easy. it didn't get as bad in terms of like weather, like Fairbanks, but it was still negative twenties, negative twenty. It's it's right on the ocean though, too, right? Um, Anchorage, no. Is there is there like a bay there or something or no? Mm-mm, no, okay. it was surrounded by land. Okay, damn. There might okay. be as you're driving down, uh, I think it's like down south towards Seward, you pass by a body of water, but uh-huh, it, uh-huh. Anchorage is pretty pretty landlocked. And just all mountains and stuff everywhere. Yes. Like hell of yeah. mountains. Right? Yes, the mountains are so nice. I never got tired of looking at the scenery. It either in the summer or in the winter, it was always just nice. Just looking outside and just seeing like the different mountains and bald eagles everywhere yeah yeah i i actually did a, a drive from montana to alaska and drove around in there Ooh. um went around and saw denali and uh, went down to valdez which was like really beautiful like mm-hmm. right on the water and huge mountains coming right out of the ocean and stuff it's like it's sick it's so cool like it was yeah, it, it's pretty surreal I, I lived in montana for four years i lived like near the mountains i live i i you know i have a view over the mountains right outside of this window that i'm looking at here in idaho and um but it's just nothing comparable like oh they're so much bigger and everything's bigger and better and just so mountains on top of mountains like mm-hmm. it's it's amazing um yeah. and then tons of good fish to eat like i yep. ate like my body weight in fish when i went to alaska and lots of salmon to eat during salmon season yeah and then just like they they have a good like just all kinds of seafood and stuff lobster and everything so just badass uh, it's a very underrated place it's hard to get to mm-hmm. is that where you met ross because i know didn't he live there too yeah so i did a local meet it was like my second meet that i ever did i did a local meet and he was a head ref and then we just kind of linked up after that that's cool that's nice that you um you know you didn't just find someone online like you actually met in person you have those mm-hmm. like in-person bonds how long were you guys together then in anchorage before you had to bounce uh, I want to say maybe like a year, maybe two years. Okay, cool. So you guys yeah. actually know each other then like pretty well. Yeah. Yeah. That's cool. That's really nice. And then he moved to like Georgia or something now. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's he's it. over, that's... I want to say Savannah area. That's another could crazy be wrong. going from cold and like, and I'm my mind like nice climate, <laughs> like the Northwest to then now it's going to be hot and sweaty down there. Uh, yeah in Georgia is a big change for him. Um, all right. What was the first sport that you played growing up? Track. track. My mom got you, me in the track. What'd you do? Um, do you remember? I think I was six, but, um, I did track growing up and then I started to specialize in the 100 and four by one, basically 100. And, um, uh, then I did the 200 and then I sort of transitioned out of doing the 200 as much. And I just started focusing just on the 100. Wow. So you're just like an elite athlete, like 100, like those are the, that's like the rock star of track. Yeah. That's the headliner. Yeah. That's the headliner. So So you're, you're fast. You didn't do anything. You didn't do anything. I was fast. That was a long time ago. I tried sprinting before and I could, it, it, I'm not what I used to be. Now I know what my coach was talking about. Cherish these moments because you'll never be this fast again. And I was sprinting and it was so slow, so slow. Do you have to do anything like that with, with military stuff? Like, do you have to go through like physical training and stuff again? And like, do you have to pass any kind of like running things where you have to run like a mile or something? So, yeah, we have a PT test. The Air Force does. Well, our branches do. But for the Air Force PT test, it consists of the main components are um, push-ups, regular push-ups, regular sit-ups, and then a mile and a half run. 
but they've added some new components, some alternate components. So instead of push-ups, you can do um, a plank. And instead of doing sit-ups, you can do, it's called a cross-leg reverse crunch. Okay. Or, yeah, I forgot what the other one was. And then instead of having to run a mile and a half, you can do something called like a, it's a shuttle run. It's a 20 meter hammer. So you have two lines, 20 meters apart, and you have audio that you're listening to. And when the beat goes, you sprint down to one end and then that's one, and that's one shuttle. And then the beat will sound again and you have to beat the, the, the beep. You have to beat the beat to the next line. Okay. Um, and then that's another shuttle. And so we do the, you can either do shuttle run or run or just the alternate components of the um, other parts of the PT test. And then do you have to do that like every year or every six months or like what? Depending on what your score is. So if you score 75 to 89.9, you have to test twice a year. If you okay. 90 and above, it's um, once a year. All right. So are you in that once a year category? Once a year. Okay. Yeah. Because even running a mile and a half can't be that hard for you. Uh, you know, it's a little windy. I did, I did the, uh, I did the shuttle run instead. I found that to be a lot easier. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah. The sprint. Yeah. Cause you got, you're strong. You're like a little more explosive probably than, than yeah. Endurance cardio that that's just, yeah, don't want to burn your suit. game. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And since you've always been a hundred meter, you know, uh, it's a hundred meter. Yeah. hundred so, meters. Yeah. Yeah. Then that's probably a good fit for you. All right. Did you ever do any other sports? Did you do any um, team sports? I did basketball recreationally and I did a year of volleyball. I don't know why I quit volleyball. I enjoyed that one a lot. Yeah. And that was pretty much it. Track, basketball, volleyball, ultimate Frisbee. I found out about ultimate Frisbee oh, after man. I joined the military. And we would do that um, when we did have unit PT um, on the do your own thing days. We'd play ultimate Frisbee or flag football. Found out that I'm pretty good at ultimate Frisbee. Nice. I love ultimate frisbee. I was yeah. I was crazy into uh ultimate frisbee and disc golf and stuff like you know disc sports and whatnot. Yeah. Um, it's a good workout actually. It's kind of like soccer. Like you're running a lot. Like when you yeah. do ultimate frisbee, it's fun if you know how to throw and catch. You know. Yeah. That's the hard part for a lot of people. Um. Okay. Well, when you're not doing powerlifting and let's say like, what's your idea of a good time? Like, if you could do a weekend, like fantasy weekend where it's like, um, you know pretend like the world doesn't exist you don't have a job nothing it's like it's like everything stops time out on life and you could take two days and just do whatever like what would you do i like traveling so if i can just maybe take a quick trip somewhere and i like doing things whenever i i travel like i enjoy skydiving i've only been once and i've been trying to go back so i think do like a little bit of skydiving and then just to like maybe get a massage and just to kick back and relax. I'm really big into relaxing now. Whereas when I was younger, it was always like, go, 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 go. Just always got to do something. Yeah. Always have to be somewhere, go to somebody's club or something. But now I think I just like to, you know, maybe go skydiving and relax. And then that's it. Yeah, exactly. Skydive, get a nice room in a hotel, kick it, yes. have a nice meal. Yeah. Drinks. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm like very, like, I think as you get older, you start to appreciate the finer things in life yeah. a little bit and less of them commotion and stuff. So yeah, I feel you on that. That's cool. I'm definitely going to like, uh, you know, when there's this, this day off in Malta in the middle, we can all go do something fun or mm -hmm. after the banquet, I'm definitely not going to do like whatever you're doing. Like I'm not doing, <laughs> skydiving. <laughs> I'm not doing zip lining. I'm like, I haven't crazy... even looked up if they have skydiving in Malta, but if they do, no, not me. There. Yeah, right I'll watch you. I'll I'll cheer you on. I'll be waiting at the bottom, you know. But no. Yeah. Um, I even love doing stuff like that. Zip line, I think I I could totally handle. I do have like a crazy fear of heights, but I like it too. Like it me makes too. It, it makes it so that like when you do these scary things, like I did that thing on top of the uh, tower in Vegas, where it's like it shoots you up and then just drops you down. You know. Yeah. And I was that. like, I was like shitting my pants. Like I was so Same. scared. I was a like when we were going up there, my wife and I were walking up. I was like, I was just looking over the edge and stuff. And I'm just like, I'm, I can't do this. Like, I was like, 
I've never backed out of a thing I bought a ticket for, <laughs> you know what yeah. I mean? And that was an expensive ticket. It was like 50 bucks or something. My wife was like, you're, mm-hmm. you're not, you're not backing out now. Yeah. And there's like a, we have a picture of it somewhere and I'm just like looking like so scared in the picture. It's hilarious, but and, it makes it fun. And then after you're done, after you're done, you're like, I want to go again. Yeah, exactly. I definitely yeah. did not want to go again. I was like, oh. I, was like I don't want to go. It was like windy up there. And I was like, I was like, dude, this is scary as hell. Um, I was kind of like, what do we get ourselves into? Which I've never thought that before. Like, but that's the cool thing about being afraid of heights and then like embracing that Mm -hmm. is like, it makes it way more exciting. You know, if you don't have a fear of heights and you're in that super tall building and you're going out on the roof of it and around the edge and stuff, and you're just, then there's like no point. It doesn't, it's not as exciting, you know, but Mm -hmm. when you're like shitting your pants, like I was, I was like, damn, I got my 50, I got my $50 worth. I was like, came this close to a heart attack, you know? (laughs) Yeah. Worth um, it. I had to find that picture. If I find that picture, I'll take a, I'll take a picture and send it to you. My face on there. It's just ridiculous. It's one of the, please do. I want to see. Um, okay. Uh, in, in powerlifting, who is a person that you look up to? Hmm. Good question. Or that you like looked up to when you're coming up and stuff. Well, we already talked about, I looked up to Kim yeah. But someone that I look up to. I'm gonna sound cheesy. I'm gonna say my brother. Okay. I look up to him a lot. Uh he just he he's the reason why I got into powerlifting and you know he's still doing it and he's about to do uh I think he was doing USPA meets and he switched over to um powerlifting America and he's about to do this nationals and then maybe 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 go further I'm just I'm just really excited for him like he gives me inspiration you know and he's also the reason why I stuck with powerlifting because there was a point in time I was like you know I think I'm done and he's like yeah you're not done and I said okay well I guess I got to keep doing it because he said I gotta I gotta Um, stick around but um yeah just talking about powerlifting with him I think I enjoy the most out of everybody is talking about powerlifting with him and watching him lift. Now, I know that I said earlier that um, I don't, I, I'll watch a powerlifting meet up until maybe second bench with his meets. Um, I'll try to watch the whole thing. And then he'll text me. He'll say, how did that look? I'm like, you know, you need to go up. He's like, all right. Or, or that looked really good. Or he'll say, let me know when I'm so many people out because I'm just going to put my headphones on and I'm just going to, you know, only your messages are going to come through. So just let me know. And I'm like, okay. But yeah, I really enjoy the fact that I can participate in this sport with my brother. Mm-hmm. And I don't know, I think, that, does that sound cheesy? Not no, even if it does cheesy. sound cheesy, even if it does sound cheesy, I don't care, whatever. I, yeah, I love exactly. him to death. And, and I'm glad that, that we're able to, um, we already have a close bond and I'm glad that, you know, we have something that we both love to do. And then, you know, we can share our experiences with each other and in the sport. So I'm really excited to watch him. I'm I'm really, really, really excited to watch him for his uh, equip meet. Yeah. I'm also upset that I can't be there. I already looked at plane prices and ticket prices and it was going to cost an arm and a leg for me to go from here to Scottsdale, stay in the States for like a week and then go to Malta yeah like the next week oh and that yeah that would ruin it, your prep like yeah, yeah. You, wanna, you, you can't so if it was if the meet was either later or yeah. even a little bit earlier i would have definitely loved to be there for him yeah like he's there for me he's there for me at all the time he's been at more of my meets i don't think i've ever been to any of his meets just because i'm stationed overseas yeah it's tougher for you um yeah, yeah i know Nick, the timing again it's like the, our, our federation is such a like ragtag group of uh you know on the on the ec and stuff that's putting everything together it's like a handful of people doing all this work organizing and there's so much that goes into the hosting these meets that like i never would have known uh beforehand about like when you book the venues and you can't book a venue because it's spring break and all, all the venue all the hotels are full or this or that and there's a reason like why the meets end up being when they are mm-hmm. um you know in order to make it affordable it's already expensive for the athletes and it would be even more expensive if we were like I think in Scottsdale, it was like just a little bit earlier and it was like going to be a lot more expensive, but you're Mm. right. It would be cool if the meet was around like now, like Mm -hmm. sort of like four or five weeks uh, out or or six weeks out from, from worlds. And then 
you people could kind of go and do both. It definitely is going to limit our open lifters ability to like go and help the juniors and the sub juniors and the masters mm-hmm. and the equip side of things um, because of them being so close like that. A lot of coaches and stuff are going to be headed to Malta. So it's going to be tough on them too. So we'll definitely, you know, um, this, this calendar for the first year and a half of powerlifting America's existence and stuff is like um, going to get ironed out as we go forward, mm-hmm. you know, and kind of get, get better. So well, that's definitely a priority for us. Uh, Cause even like for our team, like Mike Z, me, a bunch of people, Tamara, everyone, you know, all the head coach, all the coaches, um, all the refs, they're all going to be in Scottsdale and then turn right around and head to Malta. So it's a big, it's a big deal for all of us. All right. A couple more here. What's your favorite sports team? Do you have one? Do you watch sports? Uh, I used to watch basketball all the time and I like the Celtics. Uh, all right. So we'll no say reason. I just, I just picked the Celtics. You kind of yeah. lived in that area a little, you lived in the East coast a little bit. Yeah, right? a little bit. Yeah. A little far from Massachusetts, but I was think... your, was there a player on the team that you liked or something? Just or? The team itself. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. You like green. I um, do actually. I didn't want to say that, but I picked them because they're green. <laughs> That's cool. That's great. One of the best teams of all time. It's a good one to pick. I love blue. Um, what's your favorite music genre? I like R and B. Okay. Yeah, I like I really like especially nineties R and B. That's usually okay. where I live. Okay, I'm um, gonna write that down so I can try to get some nineties R and B on your reels. Um, who's who's like your favorite artist? Favorite artist of all time, like singer. Yeah. Go Whitney ahead, Houston. I, 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 it hasn't changed. Dude. It's been Whitney Houston since I was little. I love that you said that. Um, my wife didn't know who Whitney Houston was. Uh, oh. she, she's from India. And um, oh, okay. there's a new, um, maybe is it like a Netflix documentary or there's something Netflix or HBO has a, a brand new documentary about her. There's always a documentary about her. <laughs> yeah. But it's like a good one, like a, a new, okay. a new one. That's good. Um, yeah. Like I watched bodyguard, like sappy, like when I was like, I don't know mm-hmm. how old I was like 10 years old or some shit. And I like, I just always remember her as being like one of the best yeah uh, so that's cool cool yeah, that was like, my first cd i think i made all lays in school my mom she took me to go get a cd and i said i want i want this one she's like out of all these other ones she's just looking at me like okay you can have the bodyguard soundtrack that's what it was bodyguard soundtrack. yeah, yeah. So, wow i already okay. knew it's just going in walking into just, we're just dating ourselves i mean that's all it is you know what um, <laughs> you said cd some people who are listening to this are like what is that um that was always my thing. Like if I, if I got like an extra 20 bucks, it was like, boom, best buy. I'm going to buy yeah. some random CD. Um, best buy. I was going to Sam Goody. Oh, nice. Nice. Yeah. yeah. I was in Omaha. We didn't have a Sam Goody. Oh, but, okay. But, yeah. um, but yeah, the, uh, just like, think about it today. Like you can just listen to anything like mm-hmm. streaming, like, Oh my God, it's so nice. Like these kids, these days, they've got it made. Um, they do. do you have a favorite rapper? Favorite rapper. No, no. I, I think the genre, the genre as a, as I wear a Fuji's t shirt. <laughs> um, but yeah, I was I gonna think, say, uh, the genre as a whole. I don't have a favorite. Okay. I think right now I'm listening to a lot of uh Snoop Dogg, like old Snoop Dogg. And let me check my thing nice. real quick. Um, listen to a lot of '80s rap. I don't know why it just popped up. LL Cool J, I'm Bad is probably one of my favorite songs right now. Oh my goodness. Just for In the Gym, just because he's just like, just so braggadocious in that song. I love and it. And that's yeah. just how I'm feeling whenever I'm about to hit a PR. I had uh, an LL Cool J album when I was like, probably like eight years old. I remember it. Um, I have Naughty by Nature on here. I have a lot of old school Bad Boy on here. I don't think I really listen to anybody that's too current right now. Okay. That that sticks out. Seems like you have decent, like on on Instagram at least. You you sometimes have rap songs on there. Um, I don't know. Maybe my brain. I see so much. Stuff. No, I I think I do. Well, I know I do. Yeah. Um, but as far as like a favorite one, I don't think I have a favorite rap artist. I think I I like the the genre as a whole. Mm-hmm. So I just like everybody. All right. Okay. Uh, last one will be. Uh, movie movie genre and like if you got favorite actor movie genre 
Yeah. I don't have a favorite genre. I have a favorite movie. Okay, what's your favorite movie? Little Mermaid. All right. Oh, are you... Don't judge me. Is this the new Little Mermaid? Is there is there a new Little Mermaid or something? Yeah, there's a new one coming out. Lots of controversy. Um, I don't like think the... it's going to be good just because it's live action. And from what I've seen action. from the trailer, I'm still going to watch it. Still my favorite movie of all time. I can quote that movie like as the movie's playing, sound effects and everything. I've been watching that movie since I was a tiny, wow. tiny child. Same um, here. I had a little sister two years younger than me that like put that movie on like 24 seven. Like I probably could have quoted it until thankfully, like, you know, time, time heals all wounds. Right. (laughs) (laughs) Now I can't remember. I'm sure if you put it on right now, I'd probably start being able to do some of the. I actually had a, had a a dental appointment the other day and I heard noises coming out of one of the rooms. And I'm like, that sounds like little mermaid. And somebody (laughs) was watching the little mermaid. And it was like muffled and they're like, yeah, and I could still make it out. Yeah. I I knew what part the ship had just exploded. Let me stop. (laughs) But uh, if I had to pick a favorite genre, I think I would go with action. I know that's a far cry from Little Mermaid, but I think I would Mm -hmm. go with, with action. I like the action movies. Like Jason Bourne stuff or. Yeah. I like, I really like sci-fi movies too. Okay. So I'll play movies at work and I think we're on a sci-fi kick right now. We've watched. A lot of older sci-fi movies like Contact and um, I think we watched Aliens one time. Um, nice. Thrillers. Close Encounters. Yeah. Cool. But yeah. All right. Well, Dana, uh, I've taken up like your entire Saturday morning for you, oh, Friday night for morning. me. Um, I apologize. Um, but right. This is really cool. Um, like so, so, so cool to get to know you more for people who don't know, like go follow her on YouTube and watch, you get to see more of her personality way more than she shows on Instagram. And then she shows in real life at meets, um, and get to know her a little bit more. Hopefully this episode of the podcast will help with that as well. Is there anyone that you want to thank anyone you want to shout out anything like that before we cut this off? Yeah, uh, shout out to my parents because without them, I would not be here. <laughs> shout out to uh, my brother for being my inspiration um, and, you know, always being there for me. Um, of course, Mike, Ross, Pia, um, Powerlift in America, the whole team, um, Okinawa Powerlifting, uh, the family that we've we've built here on base and you know everyone who was stationed here and and has left that was a part of the Okinawa powerlifting fam and shout out to y'all and uh shout out to us and yeah if I'm missing you blame it on my mind and not on my heart blame it on the fact that we've been going we made her talk for like over two hours already so that's crazy um but all right dana i'm gonna let you go um this has been dana mcneil the back-to-back 70 key, 76 kilo national champion can't wait to see what you do at malta can't wait to hook up at malta and just hang out get to know you even more we'll shoot some videos on you and stuff like uh, put you out there in the world a little bit more and everything and um i just i hope that you kill it i'm sure you will you're a huge you're an amazing competitor so it's gonna be badass And um, with that, we'll say uh, thank you to everyone who's been listening to the Poverty in America podcast. Peace out.